it's all good. Video is also working. Yeah, that sometimes happens. I don't know why. Is GoPro? I think it needs to be focused. Yeah, it needs to be focused to someone. It was focused to Mohammed for some reason. <laughs> oh. Okay, good. Like the video panel. And the sound is also okay. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks. Okay, I think we can get started around time. Seems to be working too. Okay, uh, we've covered a bunch of stuff uh, in computer architecture so far. I think this is this is about two thirds of the way, maybe a bit over two thirds, but somewhere around there. So that's good. Uh, and we talked a lot about the memory system. Uh, for, we took a memory-centric perspective to begin with. Uh, this particular lecture is going to be on prefetching, which is clearly related to the memory system, but it's been developed to reduce the latency of access to data uh, from a compute-centric perspective. Uh, but it's very fundamental, I think. So prefetching is going to be even more important in future systems, even if they're memory-centric, because uh, even if you're memory-centric, there's some memory latency that you have and uh, even in systems like processing in memory, you may need to have prefetchers. In fact, we have seen that, right? When we talked about the Tesseract graph analytics accelerator, we had added prefetching mechanisms uh, to prefetch data. Uh, so I think this is going to be really, really important into the future. And it's, a lot of, uh, it's, a, it's an area that, uh, that is a lot of fun, in my opinion, because there's a lot of room for creativity in prefetching and uh, innovation as well. So let's get started. So clearly, uh, we're targeting memory latency in this case. And again, prefetching is an idea that's applicable to any system when you have latency, when you need to move some data somewhere, and you want to get that data there earlier. right? And we discussed that memory latency is not uh, going well. Let's say fundamental device latency is not improving, uh, yet it's critical for system performance. Uh, and uh, this paper uh, shows that new DRM types may increase latency, and it's not good for system performance overall. Uh, and then we have discussed some techniques for latency reduction, latency tolerance, and latency hiding. I want to distinguish between them a little bit, because these terms are actually uh, a little bit abused and misused, in my opinion, even sometimes by us. Uh, uh, if you're careless about the terminology, sometimes uh, you may use one term for the other. But I think there are three major ways of handling latency. One we have seen a lot, right? Fundamentally reduce the latency of the device as much as possible. And I believe this is a more data-centric approach. Uh, basically, you're trying to, uh, because you value the data, uh, you're trying to reduce the access latency to data as much as possible, right? Ideally, zero latency memory. And we've already had lectures on this. Part of lecture eight and part of lecture nine was on memory latency, and you can find them if you forgot, but we talked a lot about this. So, but there are two other ways of handling latency. One is hide the latency seen by the processor. You have a compute unit and you, have, you need to bring data to it. Hide the latency. So how do you light the latency? By two, there are two major methods, caching and prefetching in general. So what, do, what these methods do is they, from the processor's perspective, they do reduce latency. They don't do it fundamentally. They don't reduce the latency of the access to data, but they reduce the latency of access to data from the processor's perspective. Even though the memory device is still far and slow, uh, if you bring the uh, data, uh, if, if, if the processor finds the data in the cache or prefetch buffer, then it can see low latency. They're, basically, you're hiding the latency. Uh, you can also think about this reducing the latency that's seen by the processor. But I don't want to use the reduce over here because th these are two different kinds of reductions, right? And then uh, there's another approach, which, which we've also seen, actually, 
Uh, this is tolerating or amortizing the latency seen by the processor. This is again a processor-centric approach. Uh, and uh, tolerating latency means that you have a long latency operation that's going on. You, you may not have reduced the latency using caching and prefetching, but you parallelize this long latency operation with many other long latency operations that you need. As a result, you wait only once for 10 operations, for example, or N operations, as opposed to waiting once for H operation. That's the idea. And this happens with multi-threading, out-of-order execution, and run-ahead execution, uh, which we have covered uh, briefly, and we'll cover more. But multi-threading is clearly, if you execute for multiple different threads, if one of them waits for a cache miss, if all of them wait for a cache miss, then basically you're amortizing the stall of many cache misses only once, assuming all of them can be serviced in parallel. Right? Out of word execution does something similar, basically. So these are two, uh, three, uh, three major approaches, essentially. And I like distinguishing between them before starting this lecture. So we're going to talk uh, especially about prefetching over here. But Rene, we'll see that Rene is a form of prefetching as well. And in a sense, you could consider out of word execution a form of prefetching as well, right? You're looking ahead in the instruction stream in an out of order processor to uh, tolerate the latency of some instructions. And if you think about it from a memory perspective, you're basically uh, finding later loads in the instruction stream and executing them early compared to an in order processor. Okay, so you have seen this slide before. Uh, these are several techniques. Uh, we're, we're going to focus on prefetching, as I said. And there are many lectures. We don't have time to focus on multi-threading, and I don't intend to introduce it this year. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff that goes on in multi-threading. You can take a look. Out of order execution we covered in digital design and computer architecture. I know some of you have not taken that course, but you can learn a lot about out of order execution by watching lectures in uh, digital design and computer architecture. And caching we also covered in digital design and computer architecture, actually. I'll give you some more lectures if you're interested. And you've already implemented caches. Okay, so prefetching. What is the idea? The idea is to fetch the data before it's needed by the program. It's, it's very simple. Prefetch or preload uh, the data. Uh, why? Because memory latency is high. And if you can prefetch accurately and early enough, you can reduce or even eliminate that latency. So the uh, by the time the processor accesses the data, the data is already brought into the cache or prefetch buffer. So it could processor could see just the latency of an L1 cache if you've done it well. And the huge benefit of this is compared to caching uh, is you can eliminate compulsory cache misses. Compulsory means this is the first time you're touching an address. You've never seen this address before. The processor never, the program never generated this address. But because you're predicting ahead with using some method, you brought the data that is in that address into the cache or prefetch buffer. So compulsory cache misses are, can be eliminated. Caching cannot do that clearly, right? Caching by definition, uh, at least at the cache block granularity, if you look at the cache block granularity, it's not eliminating any new accesses to new cache blocks that you have not seen uh, before. Okay, so uh, can it eliminate all cache misses? Uh, cache misses are classified into different categories, right? Capacity, conflict, coherence, and compulsory. Compulsory means you've never seen the address. Capacity means your cache is too small. Conflict means your associativity is too small. Uh, there's a hot set, basically, and uh, there are too many data elements that map to the hot set. In fact, uh, prefetching can eliminate all of these cache misses in the end, uh, because uh, you're not bound by the cache capacity, right? Uh, you, can, you can prefetch ahead, uh, even though your cache may not may be small, you can keep prefetching data into it just, uh, just ahead of time uh, before the processor touches the data. We're going to talk a lot more about coherence in later lectures, and I'm going to mention that also. So uh, clearly this involves predicting which address will be needed in the future. So you're, you need to look into the future somehow or based on the past access patterns, you need to predict what will happen in the future. So, uh, which means that you need to have some sort of predictability in the miss address patterns, or you need to do something more creative maybe, maybe pre-execute the program in some way, right? Any questions? Well, this is basic to start with, yes. We're going to talk about that. Yeah, that's one of the design choices in prefetchers. Where do you put the data? Uh, in most existing processors, it's put inside the cache, actually. But there could be prefetch buffers also. Yeah. So we're going to talk about all of those. Yes. It's, it's probably not a good idea to keep the replacement policy the same. Yes. Yeah, there's a lot of work in that area. OK, good questions. Uh, OK, why is this? Okay. 
sticking out. Okay, so prefetching uh, is uh, basically, uh, if you think about branch misprediction, uh, we've talked about branch mispredictions, branch prediction in digital design and computer architecture. Whenever you fetch a branch, you need to, you predict the direction so that you can keep the pipeline full, or you predict the target address so that you can keep the pipeline full. If you mispredict, you're on the wrong path in the execution of the program. Uh, that sort of prediction affects correctness, right? If you mispredict and you don't know that you mispredicted, you never recover, so you don't, uh, uh, you, you get wrong values basically in the end. Uh, you need to basically resolve the branch mispredictions and uh, correct them and start from the correct path. But prefetching doesn't have that problem. In that sense, it's nicer and easier because if you do make a misprediction in prefetching, you don't affect correctness, right? You basically bring useless data. Essentially, prefetched data at a mispredicted address is simply not used. And if the address is not accessible by the program, you do the necessary checks and make sure you don't load it. If you don't do the necessary checks, then you have a problem, of course. <laughs> so essentially, there is no need for state recovery uh, when you do prefetching. That's the good part. Now, the difficulty with some side channels is when you prefetch data, you may bring some data that may actually lead to uh, potential side channels, but we're not going to consider that uh, currently. That makes things a little bit uh, messy, if you will. Uh, but basically, there is no need for state recovery for correct execution, uh, in contrast to branch misprediction or value misprediction. Okay, so it's going to be nice. You can actually uh, uh, innovate without thinking about this recovery mechanism. That doesn't mean that you can basically prefetch random stuff, because that's going to affect clearly your memory bandwidth, for example, and the conflicts in the cache, uh, because you, you may actually prefetch a lot of useless data, and you don't want to do that clearly. So let's talk about some basics. In modern systems, prefetching is usually done at cache block granularity because we're talking about cache-based systems. And it can reduce both the miss rate of the cache and the miss latency of the cache. It can be done by a lot of different, let's say, agents, hardware, compiler, programmer, system. We're going to talk about some of these. Uh, so the room for innovation is a lot. Uh, this is actually from a paper that we wrote in 2005. Uh, a system, at, uh, this is an example hardware prefetcher, for example. Uh, a hardware prefetcher fits uh, in the system like this. You can see that this is an old system because memory control is off-chip, right? There was a time at, uh, when the memory controllers were off-chip, so they had their own chip. Uh, but anyway, if you look at this, uh, there's a prefetcher over here that observes some requests that is going into L2, and that tries to predict patterns in those requests. And based on the patterns, it basically inject prefetches into the L2. It could also inject into the iCache or dcache, but this is what the design choice was. And basically, uh, you, you figure out some patterns and uh, inject some prefetches. If the prefetches miss the L2, uh, you go to uh, the next level. Uh, they, they get serviced from the memory controller, the EM banks, and they get brought into the L2 and maybe to the iCache or dcache. But in this particular case, it's the L2. So that's the idea. This is one example prefetcher. In modern systems, you have prefetchers all over the place. There's a prefetcher over here that prefetches data from L2 to L1. Uh, there's a prefetcher over here. There could be a prefetcher in the memory controller. So it could basically have many, many prefetchers. And that's what a modern system looks like. This is, there's nothing special about only one prefetcher, basically. And coordinating those prefetchers can become a problem also, actually. OK. Any other questions so far? OK, this is an example, hardware prefetcher. We're going to talk about software prefetchers also. So there are four major questions in prefetching. And it basically boils down to what, when, where, and how. And we're going to examine all of them. So what addresses to prefetch? Basically, what is the address prediction algorithm? And this is actually uh, very important because there's a lot of room for innovation over here. And people have come up with very, very in innovative things. And we still need to come up with more innovative things going into the future. When is when to initiate a prefetch request? Like, when do you decide to do it? Uh, how early should you be? Uh, how late can you be? Uh, should you be on time? Basically, prefetches can be classified in terms of their lateness, if you will. Where? There are many questions in where, actually. Where do you place the prefetch data? Do you place it into caches? Do you place it in a separate buffer? Where do you place the prefetcher? Which level in the memory hierarchy? And uh, we're going to see another where over there. But uh, And then how is how does the prefetcher operate and who operates it? Software, hardware, uh, or is it execution-based? Is it cooperative between software and hardware? Are there multiple prefetchers, hybrid prefetchers? We're going to see all of these. Now let's talk about uh, these questions a little, in a little bit more detail. So what addresses to prefetch is clearly critical because you don't want to prefetch useless data that wastes resources. 
uh, because uh, there are many resources that are important, right? We don't want to waste these resources because they're right, very precious. Memory bandwidth is clearly one of the most important resources we have. Cache or prefetch buffer space. If you prefetch useless data, you're basically evicting something that's potentially more useful. Energy consumption, clearly, because we talked about data movement. Essentially, whenever you're prefetching useless data, you're wasting energy on useless data. Uh, and uh, these could all be utilized by demand requests or more accurate prefetch requests. That's why you don't want useless prefetches in general. But we will see that uh, uh, not having uh, any useless prefetches is difficult uh, because uh, that reduces uh, coverage. Coverage is coverage of how many, how many, what, what fraction of the cache misses do you actually prefetch? There's usually a trade off between coverage and accuracy, as we will see. But accurate prediction is still important. Uh, prefetch accuracy is defined as the number of prefetches that are used by the program divided by the number of prefetches that are sent by the prefetcher. So it's simple, hopefully. OK, so of course, the question is, how do you know what to prefetch? That's dictated by uh, the algorithm uh, for uh, prefetching. And one option is to predict based on past access patterns. And we will see this a lot. Uh, another option could be used to, using the compilers or programmers' knowledge of data structures and their traversal. Right? You could have one loop, for example, prefetching for another loop. If the compiler is smart, they could potentially do that. If the program is smart, they can also do that. But they should also make sure that that loop that's doing the prefetching doesn't stall uh, too much, right? So there are a lot of tricks you can play, actually. And it's, as I said, prefetching is a broad uh, uh, problem. It's not just in chips. Uh, it can also be done on the, over the internet, right? Whenever, for example, my Chrome browser over here or whatever browser you're using, it may predict what... Uh, pages that I'm going to access and may prefetch those pages into its cache or prefetch buffer. So it can actually do this uh, auto automatically. Or the operating system that's, uh, uh, that I'm using may predict uh, what application I'm going to launch at what time of the day, and it can prefetch uh, the data and the contents of that application early on uh, into the memory, for example. So there, this is actually a very uh, broadly applicable idea. Because all of those are latency critical issues, right? Potentially. Uh, and prefetching algorithm determines what to prefetch, as we discussed. And we're going to see a lot of prefetching algorithms. So when, uh, if there are questions, please stop me. But these are some basics we're going to go through. And then we're going to cover a lot of, let's say, more uh, interesting things. Uh, but it's important to cover the basics because these uh, dictate how you design the prefetchers. So when to initiate a prefetch request? If you prefetch too early, prefetch data may not be used before it's evicted from the storage that is brought into. So that's not good, clearly because you wasted it. Even though the prefetch may be accurate, it may be too early, right? Prefetching too late might not hide the whole memory latency, right? You may have 500 cycle memory latency and you prefetch too late, you may hide only one cycle of it. Essentially, that's not beneficial, right? Well, one out of 500 improvement may not be, uh, may have zero impact on performance clearly, right? Uh, so when a data item is prefetched, affects the timeliness of the prefetcher. And prefetcher can be made more timely by making it more aggressive. Uh, uh, for example, you can try, try to stay far ahead of the processor's demand access stream in hardware. When the processor is accessing, if the access pattern is address A, A plus 4, A plus 8, A plus 12, A plus 16, A plus 20, clearly there's a stride of 4. And the prefetcher can easily detect that, a hardware prefetcher. This is called a stride prefetcher, as we will see. Uh, but if you, whenever the processor is accessing address A, if you try to prefetch address A plus 4, the processor may try to access address A plus four one cycle later. So you're basically too late. So if you really want to get ahead of the processor's access stream, whenever the processor accesses address A, you should probably be accessing address A plus, I don't know, 64, for example. That's essentially 16 strides ahead of what the processor is accessing. So basically, it's a function of the memory latency and how long, the, how long will it take to get the data back. So clearly, you need to stay ahead of the processor's access stream so that you can hide the whole memory latency. But if you, if you become more aggressive, uh, what happens is you basically prefetch address A plus 64, but the processor may never want address A plus 64, right? The processor, maybe its, maybe it's access pattern is A, A plus 4, A plus 8, A plus 16, A plus 12, A plus 16, and it's going to stop at address A plus 20, right? <laughs> but you prefetch A plus 64, A plus 68 in anticipation that the processor will get there, but the processor may never get there. So this is the fundamental trade-off. To improve the timeliness, you need to be more aggressive. But once you become more aggressive, you reduce the accuracy. If you're more aggressive, you also can improve the coverage. So these are three metrics to evaluate a prefetcher, accuracy, timeliness, coverage. And normally, 
you have to trade off between them. You cannot get the best in all metrics. This is another example of three metrics where you can usually get two out of three, but not three out of three. Okay. So, uh, I mean, another way of making uh, the prefetcher aggressive, uh, in, in this case, a software prefetcher aggressive, is moving the prefetch instructions earlier in the code. Right? We're going to talk about software prefetching. You can insert prefetch instructions. If you move them early in the code, you basically start prefetching them early. And when the code actually needs what you have really prefetched, hopefully it will be there in the cache. But if you move the, uh, uh, move the prefetch instructions too early in the code, what happens is the code may never get to the place where you need the data because there may be a branch in between and that branch will take you to some place and the data is not needed anymore, right? So you run into these issues in software also. So basically, uh, again, you cannot get out of the timeless accuracy coverage uh, space. Uh, you really need to trade off between them carefully. Okay. So the third one is where, and as I said, where has multiple dimensions. One is where to pre place the prefetch data, which was asked earlier. Uh, since we already have caches, you can place them in the cache or in a separate prefetch buffer. If you do it in the cache, this is simple design, no need for separate buffers, right? But then you, you can potentially evict the useful demand data. You could cause cache pollution. But as we discussed yesterday, prefetches may be more important than demands, right? There might be a demand data in the cache that was brought into the cache, but it's not useful anymore. It may be dead in the cache at this point, meaning nobody is going to use that data after, afterwards. So people have developed, for example, dead block prediction methods. Uh, they, they try to predict whether uh, a block in the cache is going to be used in the future. If it's not going to be used in the future, it's marked as dead. And if, when a prefetch data comes in, maybe you replace a dead block, that is, or a block that's predicted to be dead. So there are a lot of, there's a lot of research in this area. But still, you still need to, you still have, uh, need to uh, make sure that cache pollution doesn't become a problem. If you use a separate prefetch buffer, separate from the cache, now you protect the demand data from the prefetches, so no cache pollution. That problem goes away. But unfortunately, this complicates the memory system now. So now you have a more complex memory system design and more choices to make. Where do you place the prefetch buffer? Do you have a prefetch buffer for L1, L2, L3 memory controller? Now you basically replicated the cache hierarchy like a prefetch hierarchy also. When do you access the prefetch buffer? Do you do it serially or in parallel with the cache? Now you have an energy problem if you do it in parallel. In serial, they have a latency problem potentially. When do you move the data from the prefetch buffer to the cache, or do you ever move the data from the prefetch buffer to the cache? Uh, when, when, when the processor actually accesses the prefetch buffer, do you move it to the cache? Well, if you move it to the cache, now you're causing data movement and contention for the cache. How do you size the prefetch buffer? A lot of works have shown that the prefetch buffer actually needs to be very big so that you can actually get benefits. Uh, so is it the same size as the cache? Well, you probably don't want that, right? Because today's caches are huge. So basically, this caused a lot of headaches in the design. And then there's another headache, which is keeping the prefetch buffer coherent, right? Because you may actually have uh, the content of the prefetch buffer in some other processor's cache, uh, and then that processor updates it. Now you need to actually have coherence in the prefetch buffer. So this actually complicates the system a lot. As a result, all, all modern systems that I know of prefetch data into the cache, basically. Uh, and they basically start deal with the pollution somehow. And this is also, I mean, what I didn't add over here is the, clearly the hardware cost of it, right? I said it, but the hardware cost is a big problem. Okay? Okay, I'm moving on. And then there's another where, which is which level of cache or where in the cache hierarchy to prefetch into. Uh, I mean, we, we kind of discussed this. Do you, do, do you prefetch from memory to L4, L3, L2, or memory to L1 directly? Uh, Memory to L1 tends to be quite aggressive uh, because L1 is very small. Uh, usually, uh, memory prefetchers, prefetchers that prefetch data from memory, prefetch into L2, L4, L3, or L2. And then there's a separate L2 to L1 prefetcher that tries to be, let's say, more judicious in what gets into the L1 because L1 is very small, right? It's, uh, the, the, the design decisions of L1 are dictated by the frequency of the processor, uh, not uh, the, uh, the, the, the Basically, you cannot make L1 very large if your goal is to get the data very quickly. Uh, and then there are separate, are there separate prefetchers between levels? Uh, and you will see that existing systems actually have all sorts of prefetchers across all levels. Uh, then there's the question of where do you place the prefetch data in the cache, right? This is another uh, question that was asked. Do you treat prefetch blocks the same as demand fetch blocks? Uh, in general, that's not a good idea. Uh, uh, prefetch blocks are not known to be needed, basically. Uh, 
for, for example, if you have LRU least recently used, a demand block is placed into the MRU most recently used position. Is that the right thing to do for prefetches? And people have looked at this. I'm going to talk about that in one work. Uh, but uh, uh, basically, uh, in, the, in the past, uh, some processors pre, uh, pre, uh, pre, uh, placed the prefetch data into the LRU way, least recently used way. Basically, they gave uh, the prefetch data the lowest priority in a set. And that may not be a good idea because that's the first data to be evicted, right? This is not considering the usefulness of a prefetch. In general, it's better to consider the usefulness and the accuracy of a prefetch than just blindly uh, saying, okay, this prefetch, I don't know if it's useful. Let me place it into the lowest priority position in the cache. Because that prefetch may be much more important than a dead block in the cache, right? Clearly, the dead block is dead block. You're not going to touch it. If you know that information, you can actually design a much better uh, insertion policy into the cache for prefetches and an eviction policy for other requests. Make sense? Okay. So basically, it's not as, as simple as let's place it in some predetermined position. You need to take into account the usefulness and accuracy of a prefetch. Uh, okay. I think kind of I discussed this. Do you skew the replacement policy such that it favors the demand fetch blocks? Yeah, I can, I discuss this. I don't think that's a good idea in general. And we discussed this also, right? Uh, for uh, when we talked about prefetch aware memory controllers, whenever you try to schedule between a prefetch and a demand request, sometimes you may want to prioritize prefetch requests that hit in the row buffer, for example, because those prefetch requests are quickly going to get the data from the row buffer, whereas a demand request is going to open a new row, and you still need to service that prefetch that's going to close that row and reopen the row that you just closed. So you need to be careful, basically, what you do with prefetches. And the, and the main reason is, if the prefetches were all useless, well, you shouldn't be sending those prefetches in the first place, right? Basically, you cannot assume that prefetches are all useless. A lot of the policies that are employed in some of the systems in the past have been assuming that prefetches are, by definition, useless. And I think we have developed an understanding that that's absolutely not true. Most of the prefetches are actually quite useful. So you cannot have the mindset, this is useless, let me place it at low priority. Okay. And then, uh, because if, you, if, it's, if it's useless, then don't implement the prefetcher, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, where to place the hardware prefetcher in the memory hierarchy is another question, basically, another where question. It's kind of similar to what we have discussed, but, uh, but there's another aspect to this. Uh, it, where you place the hardware prefetcher in the memory hierarchy determines what access patterns the prefetcher sees. Does it see the L1 hits and misses? That's basically all of the addresses that the thread generates or the processor generates at the L1. That's a complete access stream, clearly. But if you place it into after the L1, the prefetcher sees L1 misses only. Now it's an incomplete access stream. It's filtered. All of the L1 hits are not visible to the prefetcher. Now, if you place it lower down in the hierarchy, you may see only L1, L2 misses, for example. Now it's an even less complete access stream. So basically, the farther away you place the prefetcher from the processor, you're reducing the visibility to the access stream of uh, the processor to the prefetcher, right? So if you see a more complete access pattern, potentially you can get better accuracy and coverage in prefetching because you may actually do some pattern recognition much better. Although uh, there's a downside over there because prefetcher needs to examine, examine more requests now. It becomes very bandwidth intensive and there could be more ports into the prefetcher that's needed. Uh, and we will see that this may not be uh, easy to do. So there's a trade-off over here. Uh, makes sense, hopefully. Okay, so basically this, is, this picture hopefully gives you an idea uh, of, I mean, you could place the prefetcher over here, in which, case it's, uh, in which case it's seeing all of the accesses to L1 and then prefetching ahead. You could place the prefetcher over here after the L3 cache, then uh, on, only the L3 misses are visible to the prefetcher. So the access stream to the L3 uh, may not be as predictable uh, because of the hits that are experienced uh, over here. Okay. Okay, just to give you an idea, uh, prefetching is actually uh, employed, it could be employed in all of these levels, including uh, storage to main memory. You could, you could actually have operating system routines that are prefetching data, as we said, into the main memory. Uh, it could also be prefetching data from a, a hybrid memory, uh, a, a high latency uh, memory to a low latency memory. And increasingly, uh, in uh, large servers, uh, memory hierarchy actually extends beyond a single server. These are slides from digital design and computer architecture. That's why you have this recall. We should remove it over here. But, but basically, increasingly, uh, what happens in uh, large data centers is you need to extend your memory. Uh, and uh, a, a single node's memory is not good enough. So what you do is you disag disaggregate the memory. So you have some memory nodes. 
so that you can actually have huge amounts of memory. But this memory node is far away uh, from uh, where the application is executing, for example. So you actually connect them with a low latency network. This is called disaggregated memory, basically. Uh, and this enables higher memory capacity. But now your latencies are even higher to the data that resides in the memory nodes. Uh, now, the, uh, what you can do, of course, is prefetch early from this remote memory node so that when the compute node actually needs the data that's coming from memory node, it's already here. And that's the idea. So basically, uh, prefetching is, has extended uh, to the entire data center level uh, today because the memory, uh, the main memory system is not residing in a single node anymore. Uh, and unfortunately, this disaggregated memory exacerbates the latency issues uh, that we have today. Okay, there are some papers, but I'm not going to go into uh, those. Okay, we're, we're done with where, basically. Now you can see that the where actually encompasses a lot of things. And then there's uh, how. So how is also very interesting because you have a lot of options here, right? Uh, who does the prefetching? Software, hardware, so software, hardware cooperation, which is not shown here, but then there's execution-based. Uh, so there's a lot of room for innovation here. But software prefetching, as we will see in this case, the instruction set architecture provides instructions. A programmer or compiler inserts prefetch instructions. Clearly, they need to spend some effort. And this usually works well only for regular access patterns, unless you have some hardware support uh, for it that tries to aid, basically. Uh, because it's very difficult to uh, find irregular access patterns and prefetch for them, as we will see uh, soon. Although if you actually make a software-based execution-based uh, prefetcher, then you can actually cover a lot of access patterns, as we will also see. So software prefetching assumes that you insert instructions. But execution-based can be both hardware and software, as we will see. OK, hardware prefetching. Uh, here you have specialized hardware that monitors the memory accesses. And it memorizes, finds, or learns address strides, patterns, or correlations and generates prefetch addresses automatically. This is completely transparent to the software, basically. If you want to cooperate between them, software may potentially aid and say, for example, tell the stride. In this region, the stride, I know the stride, and the hardware can actually automatically uh, generate based on that stride, right? So there's, uh, you can actually cooperate between hardware and the software, because there are some cases where the software knows the stride uh, very well, because it knows the data structure access patterns, right? So it doesn't make sense for hardware to discover that. Uh, but of course, this requires communication between the software and hardware, meaning there needs to be instruction in the ISA uh, for the software to tell the hardware prefetcher, do this, or in this region, do this. OK, execution-based prefetchers are usually much more powerful. Uh, basically, you uh, generate a thread, and this thread is executed to prefetch data for the main program. This thread is a speculative thread, essentially. It could be generated by either software, programmer, or hardware. You can imagine writing your programs this way, right? It's not that. Uh, hard to imagine because thread-based, uh, multi-threaded programming, uh, you sh any thread that you write, uh, uh, you can share data between them. And if you know what you're doing, you can actually generate a specialized thread whose sole purpose is prefetching data for the main program that you're actually writing. That's your goal. Okay, any questions? Okay, so basically, whenever you're writing programs, you can do the software prefetching and execution-based prefetching yourself. <laughs> Hardware prefetching, unfortunately, you don't know what's going on necessarily, unless you go and reverse engineer. OK, so uh, let's see. Hopefully, we'll have only one lecture, but <laughs> there's a lectures over here also. Uh, so we're going to cover a lot of stuff. Uh, I think we've covered these two. And then uh, now we're going to start uh, with different prefetching methods. And then at some point in between, we're going to talk about prefetching performance and prefetcher throttling. And then uh, we'll talk about multi-core, multi-threading issues, but we will not go a lot into there. But a lot of the multi-core, multi-threading issues boil down to interference again. Whenever you have a prefetcher, it interferes with demand requests from other cores, for example. And prefetches of, uh, uh, also prefetches, inter uh, different prefetchers interfere with each other if they're in different cores or, or working for different threads, right? So interference, what we've covered uh, in the past lectures, is a big, it becomes a bigger problem with prefetching, it gets exacerbated. Okay, so software prefetching, uh, basically the basic idea I've already given you, right? Compiler or the programmer places prefetch instruction into appropriate place in the code. Uh, this is one early paper in software prefetching. It's not the earliest, but it's, it's the one that reports uh, strong results. Uh, and the idea is to have prefetch instructions that prefetch data into caches, and the compiler or programmer can insert such instructions into the program. So these are some example instructions, an older version of the x86 
ISA manual. Uh, but you can see that there's different types of prefetch uh, and with different hints. Uh, this is the temporal uh, locality hint, if you will. For example, uh, if you have T0, prefetch T0, uh, that means it's temporal data, meaning you expect some uh, temporal locality in the data. So prefetch data into all levels of the cache hierarchy. But unfortunately, you can see microarchitecture dependent specification over here. In the Pentium 3 processor, you get to the first or second level cache. In the Pentium 4 Intel Xeon processors, these folks rightly figured out that first level cache is small, so let's not prefetch data into the first level cache. Let's, let's uh, prefetch into the second level cache. And then there's T1, uh, prefetch data into level two cache and higher because it's temporal with respect to first level cache. So you basically uh, go to second level cache. Uh, and then there's NTA, which is non-temporal data with respect to all cache levels. You don't prefetch into the second level cache, for example, in this particular case. But again, uh, it's very microarchitecture dependent. So you can see that the specification is not uh, extremely satisfying because some of the instructions are exactly the same, T1 and T2. So you have two instructions in the ISA that do exactly the same thing in this particular specification. Uh, and then uh, not so much different. So, but, the, but the idea is uh, non-temporal data is not supposed to be brought into all cache levels. So that's because the understanding is that this is non-temporal. You don't have a lot of temporal locality. Just bring it into the L1 cache. Hopefully it'll be used. And then when it's evicted from the L1 cache, don't put it into the other cache levels. That's the idea, basically. Implementation may be completely different. In fact, even though the implementation says this, people may decide to implement none of this, right? Because this is all speculative instructions. In the end, this is not going to affect your uh, correctness of the program. This is all for performance. You cannot rely on these instructions for correctness. So if the microarchitect or the chip designer decides, oh, I have too many things to do, forget about the prefetch instructions. <laughs> At least forget about the prefetch instructions in the way they're described over here, potentially. So that's the downside of this uh, performance-based uh, optimizations uh, in the ISA, yes. Yes. Uh, no, no, compilers, uh, if you actually compile them with very aggressive code optimizations, they try to add these instructions, yes. They try to do analyses. Uh, sometimes they may ask you to profile the code, of course, right? They need profiling data sets, but they can add these instructions. GCC can add these instructions, for example, at profiling levels. And people have proposed algorithms. Uh, for example, this one uh, proposed a compiler algorithm for prefetching to do that. But of course, as we will see, this works for regular access patterns. If for irregular access patterns, it's very difficult to do. So let's take a look at their regular access pattern. Basically, this is very regular, right? Uh, you basically traverse an array. And then you can, uh, it's a streaming access pattern uh, and um, you keep incrementing I. And one way of inserting prefetch instructions over here is prefetch uh, the next cache block in I and next cache block in, uh, in, in array A and array B. That's one way. And you could actually also prefetch ahead, right, potentially. Or you could have a loop that prefetches everything. There's another loop that's just for prefetching over here. And then you execute this loop without the prefetch instructions, but just do the sum, right? That's another possible. So the hope is that these prefetch instructions do not stall the processor. That's the key. You, the processor basically uh, sends the prefetch instruction and doesn't wait for it, goes to the next instruction. The prefetch instruction gets dropped from the reorder instruction stream so that it doesn't stall the processor. That's the difference between a prefetch instruction and a load instruction. Load instruction, you have to wait until the data comes back so that you can move uh, in the instruction stream, right? Uh, so that's why you can actually have a loop uh, that does prefetching. The whole purpose is prefetching, and then you populate the cache, and hopefully this loop that just does the summation uh, always sits in the cache. Okay, but basically for regular access patterns, it's very easy to see that this works, but there are downsides also, right? Even uh, with this, prefetch instructions are, take up processing and execution bandwidth. Even though they're dropped after some point, after issuing the prefetch to the memory system, uh, they still take up processing and execution bandwidth, resources in the memory uh, execution units, for example. Uh, how are we looking to prefetch? Now determining this becomes difficult, right? Uh, what if your memory latency is 500 cycles? Uh, you need to basically prefetch ahead, uh, many, many iterations ahead uh, to cover the latency so that these prefetch instructions are actually useful and they hide the latency. Uh, they basically bring data when it's, when it's really needed uh, or before it's needed. So determining this is difficult because this is not the only thing that it's executing in the system. So you don't know the exact latencies. Exact latencies are microarchitecture dependent. 
They're dependent on the cache sizes. Basically, they're dependent on a lot of things. The compiler really needs to know the microarchitecture very well so that they can decide uh, how many iterations ahead uh, they insert these prefetch instructions. Uh, yeah. I mean, I kind of said this basically. Prefetch distance. Prefetch distance means how many iterations ahead you should insert these prefetch instructions for. It depends on the hardware implementation, memory latency, cache size, time between loop iterations. How long will, will this summation take, for example? If this becomes a much bigger loop, there is more time over here. So you can actually overlap the prefetching with, the, with that time. Uh, yeah, basically, this becomes portable. Uh, this causes portability issues. You may actually design a nice software based prefetcher for microarchitecture X. Intel does something else in their microarchitecture Y, and your prefetcher, all of the prefetch instructions that you insert into your code, cause extra processing and execution bandwidth without providing enough benefits because something else happened in the microarchitecture that eliminated the usefulness of these instructions or reduced the usefulness of these instructions. Right? Maybe memory latency reduced significantly, or maybe it's increased significantly. Right? So basically, uh, one of the issues with software prefetching is portability. You need to recompile your code for every single microarchitecture uh, to get the best out of it. And again, as I said, going too far back in code reduces accuracy. So here we have a nice example, but this doesn't probably overcome the modern memory latencies. Right? So if you really want to prefetch uh, for this summation loop, you really want to have a loop over here that does the prefetching much earlier. And then there might be some other pieces of code over here, and there might be a branch at that point, and that branches out, so you never execute this code. So you prefetch for no reason, basically, and that's probably not good. And this is actually a challenge both programmers and compilers face. How do I actually cover the huge memory latencies that I have today without doing useless, useless work? And if you try to prefetch, you will see that you will almost always do useless work, or you will decide, OK, I'm not going to deal with this. Let the hardware deal with it. That's the beauty of hardware prefetching, basically. <laughs> and then you do you need special prefetch instructions in the ISA. So people have been clever in this one. Uh, basically, they're loads. Uh, they, they basically use loads. Uh, some of them. Alpha, for example, alpha architecture, uh, a load into register 31 is treated as a prefetch because register 31 is hardwired as zero. Loading a value into register 31 makes no sense because the ISA specifies that as hardwired to zero. So they use this as a prefetch instruction. PowerSPC has a data cache block touch instruction, uh, which is kind of a nice way of seeing prefetch, right? You touch the data cache block. Okay, and then uh, the problem becomes worse if you actually have irregular access patterns. I mean, not necessarily pointer-based data structures. It could be actually very complex array accesses where the array bounds are uh, dynamically determined, not statically determined. Uh, and maybe the strides are dynamically determined also. In this case, the stride is statically determined, as you can see, right? Uh, so whenever you have dynamic uh, uh, determination of the array, array bounds as well as uh, strides, you have a problem. But we have, if you have irregular accesses like pointer-based data structures, you have another problem, which is, uh, okay, uh, this is uh, what you can potentially do, right? Uh, here, you're traversing uh, some linked list. Uh, you're doing some work on the data element of the current node, and then uh, you actually go to the next node. And what this, what this prefetch instruction does is it prefetches for, uh, prefetches the next node while uh, this work for the current node is happening, right? That sounds good, but this may not cover the 500 cycle memory latency. Maybe this work takes 10 cycles and this prefetch takes 500 cycles. So you've saved, okay, 10 cycles of latency. You really need to prefetch 50 iterations ahead, right? How do you do that? Like this. Well, in this case, three iterations, sorry. <laughs> but basically imagine that for 50. Well, does this work? Clearly not, right? <laughs> because this is going to reference P next, and then it's, it's a miss, so it's going to wait. <laughs> and clearly, this is going to be a, probably this is going to be a miss also. So this is a chain of misses, basically, that you get. So which one's better is a good question, basically. I, I don't know which one's better, but this doesn't make sense, <laughs> I would say. You could potentially try to make sense of it, but now you're actually delaying the processing to actually get all of this data. So this may actually be better than what you just done over here. <laughs> okay. So that's the problem with pointer-based data structures or, or linked data structures. Unfortunately, they're very hard to handle with prefetch. And even arrays, as I said, you need to be very clean in the arrays uh, to handle this. As a result, software prefetching, while a nice idea, uh, unfortunately, it's not, let's say, effective. Unless you have very, very regular loops. And in that case, it's effective, no question about that. 
uh, but then it also still has the downsides uh, that we've discussed over here, right? Portability. Okay, so where should I compile and insert prefetches? Uh, this is a question that we kind of uh, asked. Pre do you prefetch for every load access? This is too bandwidth intensive, clearly. Uh, do you profile the code and determine what loads that are likely to miss? This is actually a good idea, and people do that. For example, if you use GCC, it will probably ask you to profile the code. But then you, always, you run into the profiling input set problem. Uh, profiling input set may not be representative. Some loads may miss in the input set. And then when the program actually runs in the field, it may have a completely different input set. Right? And then different loads may start missing. So you optimize the code for something that's not realistic or representative. And this is, this is always a problem with compiler-based, profile-based optimizations. Right? And we already discussed this, basically. Uh, how far ahead before the miss should the prefetch be inserted? Again, you can do profiling for this, and people actually do profiling. Profile and determine the probability of use for various prefetch distances from the miss. Uh, this is basically, you look at how far, how far early in the program should you actually raise the prefetch instruction. And based on profiling results and maybe simulation results also, uh, you decide uh, the probability of the use. But then again, uh, even if you may find a good place, Profile input set may not be representative, so that completely messes up your placement. Uh, and usually, you need to insert a prefetch far in advance to cover hundreds of cycles of main memory latency. So usually, you get reduced accuracy in software prefetching methods, even, even when you have per, uh, perfectly predictable access patterns. And also, uh, I should say that this is assuming that this is the only program running in the machine, right? But we know that it's not. When you have multiple programs, multiple threads running in the machine, the hundreds of cycles, the exact memory latency is also dependent on what's running in the machine, right? So you have a problem, basically. How do you know what's your memory latency becomes a problem? Okay, so that's why people have actually focused a lot on hardware prefetching methods. And I think uh, this makes a lot of sense also. Basically, the idea is to have specialized hardware, uh, have it observe load and store access patterns or access patterns in different parts of the memory hierarchy, and prefetch data based on past access behavior. So the good thing of a hardware prefetcher is it's designed with the microarchitecture. So you can tune the hardware uh, 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 prefetcher to the system implementation. So you don't need to recompile code. The same code runs, but you tune the hardware prefetcher. Every microarchitecture comes with a tuned hardware prefetcher. That's nice, right? And the second big thing is it doesn't waste instruction execution bandwidth. You don't need prefetch instructions for this, right? It automatically generates prefetches by looking at what's going on. It doesn't touch the... Uh, well, at least some forms of hardware prefetching. Most forms of hardware prefetching don't touch the uh, execution resources at all. But of course, now you need complexity to detect access patterns, right? Uh, and software can be more efficient in some cases. If, you, if your array is nicely predictable, software is actually much more efficient. Now, you don't need hardware for that. That's why in some access patterns, hardware-software cooperation may be a good idea. Okay. Any questions? Now we're going to see a bunch of different hardware prefetchers to begin with. And the simplest one is next line prefetchers. This was actually developed in 1970s, uh, actually 1960s, sorry, not 1970s. IBM 36091 had a next line instruction prefetcher. Uh, but this is the simplest uh, form of hardware prefetching. You always prefetch the next n cache lines after a demand access or a demand miss. It's called next line prefetcher or next sequential prefetcher. IBM called it next sequential prefetcher. Uh, n could be one. And could be something to cover the memory latency. Uh, but this is simple to implement. Clearly, there is no need for sophisticated pattern detection. It works well for sequential streaming access patterns. Instruction is a great example. That's why this was first adopted in instruction, uh, um, instruction memory of microprocessors. Uh, actually, it was first used in virtual memory, da prefetching data from storage to uh, the memory. But we're ignoring that for now. But it can waste bandwidth with irregular access patterns, right? For example, uh, nope. and even with regular access patterns, right? So clearly with irregular access patterns, uh, 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 it can waste bandwidth. But even with regular access patterns, for example, uh, you have a stride of two and you use n equals one. Uh, what is your prefetch accuracy? Anybody? Basically, stride is two. I'm always accessing a, a plus two, a plus four, a plus six, a plus eight. But I'm using, I'm fetching the, always the next cache block. I would say zero. Basically, you're always prefetching the next cache block, but you're never touching the next cache block. You're always touching the next next cache block. So it's zero. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I think I'm right. 
Yeah, basically, uh, you need to, uh, if you have a stride that's greater than your n, uh, you basically get a 0% accuracy. Uh, if, you have, if you have stride equals 2 and your n equals 2, then it's one half. <laughs> basically, you're prefetching next cache block and the next next cache block, and you're always touching the next next cache block. Then it's one half, yes. <laughs> so you can do these calculations. Uh, and then there's another issue. What if, the memory, what if the program is traversing memory from higher to lower addresses? So does it really make sense to always go a, address A, A plus 1, A plus 2, A plus 3? What if the program is going backwards? Right? And this happens also in systems uh, because you're doing some programming and you have to traverse the array the other way, right? Uh, do you also prefetch the previous and cache lines? Now you've doubled the bandwidth usage that you have, right? So this is basically very rigid. Uh, you can try to make this work with some adaptivity, some care, but uh, it's not easy to make it work. So that's why people have developed stride prefetchers, which try to uh, detect this stride. And clearly, this is an example of a stride n access pattern. You always increment the address by n. And we're talking about cache blocks in this particular case, right? Uh, that's why we said cache block based prefetching. Uh, basically, the idea is to record the stride between consecutive memory accesses. If it's stable, use it to predict the next m memory accesses. And there's now another parameter, right? Uh, okay, if it's stable, so you need to have some confidence. So prefetcher may have some inertia to start prefetching or warm up period, right? You basically see the stride the first time. You say, okay, let me record it as I've seen the stride, but I'm not going to prefetch yet. Now, let me see, if you see the stride again, oh, okay, it's building confidence. Uh, and basically, usually you build some confidence before you start prefetching because the stride may not be stable, right? Uh, then the, uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit more because this is simple, but then there could be multiple strides uh, or multiple a pattern in the stride, as we will see, uh, because you're touching different data structures, right? You may actually, be, uh, you may actually have two loops. In, in, in one loop, you're actually going through different elements or different data structures, and that data structure is huge. And in, in, inside of the loop, you may actually be touching a field inside the data structure. And if it's regular, basically you have two strides now, right? Whenever you actually go through the bigger data structure, uh, you have one stride. And then whenever you actually touch a field inside the data structure, you have another stride uh, from that previous memory access. So basically the access patterns, how you access the data structures lead to these strides in the end. Uh, and this may not be as easy as this one, but let's assume that this is the case. How do you determine the stride is also an issue. Do you determine it on a per instruction basis? Basically associate a stride with a load, for example, or do you determine it on a per memory region basis? So this leads to two classes of prefetchers. Uh, one is instruction-based stride prefetching, and this is an, a possible implementation of it. Basically you have a load instruction program counter. It, it has a table over here. Uh, you basically record the instruction PC tag it, uh, and then you look at the last address referenced and this is the last stride and you have a confidence level. And then basically, whenever you see the new address that's referenced, you subtract the last address reference from the new address reference, compute the current stride, check if the current stride is equal to last stride. If that's the case, then you increment the confidence level. And if the confidence level is above some threshold, you basically issue a prefetch that's far away. Let's say far away, meaning maybe it's A plus, I don't know, uh, 2810 or whatever, right? <laughs> okay, we're going to see that also. So basically, each load store instruction can lead to a memory access pattern with a different stride. Uh, basically, the downside of this prefetcher is it can only detect strides caused by each instruction. So it cannot detect strides that may happen because of the interaction between multiple different instructions, which actually happens a lot in today's systems because of the way that I described the data structure traversals, right? Different loads uh, may actually lead to strides, different strided patterns. Now, timeliness can be an issue in this case. Uh, actually, timeliness is always an issue, but it may become an even bigger issue in this case. Uh, when you initiate the prefetch, when, you when, you, when, you, when, you, when the load is fetched the next time can be too late. So for this, a uh, potential solution is look ahead in the instruction stream, or actually, as I said, uh, there, there are two ways of looking ahead in the instruction stream, right? Basically, uh, run the instruction stream uh, faster than the back end of the processor. This is called decoupled fetch in existing processors. You have instruction stream, branch predictor, fetch engine. You decouple it from the back end of the processor. You say, I'm going to run ahead in the fetch engine using my branch predictor so that I see lots of instructions that may be potentially coming, but the back end may be slow because it's waiting for data from memory, right? So back end is not processing, but front end is processing. The way you decouple it, you have, you have the front end. Uh, actually, modern processors actually designed it this way. Uh, let's see. 
Okay, where is this? I mean, I'm not going to draw something really sophisticated, but I think it's good to visualize it. Uh, so you, you basically have a front end of the processor and then a back end. Back end is huge. And you basically have a queue. This is called the instruction queue, or it could be a UOP micro op queue. Basically, what the front end does is uh, it has the branch predictor inside. And by generating branch predictor, and it has the iCache, of course, right? Instruction cache. By generating branch predictions and the iCache, it keeps fetching instructions and keep uh, keeping on inserting them into this queue. Now, the back end may be stalled for, I don't know, thousands of cycles because there are data cache misses over here. But as long as you don't have instruction cache misses or they can be serviced and also the prefetched uh, early, uh, uh, you can basically uh, keep inserting instructions over here, right? So there, uh, you can actually have an instruction uh, cache prefetcher over here that actually prefetches data from the lower levels of the memory hierarchy into this. And maybe there's a instructions may also hit over here. And these are more predictable patterns compared to data patterns usually. Uh, so basically you run the front end much faster uh, than the back end because the back end is stalled. And you may actually, I don't know, have a thousand uh, instructions over here waiting in the queue. It's speculative clearly because you're predicting the branches, right? And you're not resolving them yet, potentially. So this way you're running the front end much faster. So you may actually get to the load earlier. Uh, so you may actually have a load over here. Uh, uh, and then you actually, uh, that load indexes uh, that, uh, this is called the data cache prefetcher in this particular case, with the program counter of the load. Basically, you can generate the program counter of the load much earlier. And then you can actually generate the data uh, prefetches much earlier in the uh, front end. That's the idea. If you have a front end that's decoupled, and this is called the decoupled front end, you can actually uh, get to the load much faster than the back end of the processor gets. As a result, you can cover some of the memory latency. And that's one way of making your prefetcher, uh, let's say, uh, more timely. Make sense? Okay. A lot of modern processors are designed this way, even though this is not taught in many places, but uh, this is a good way of designing it. There's actually a, a computer architecture letters paper from ARM that talks about these decoupled front ends. So I would recommend you take a look at it. Maybe someone, Joel, can find it and put it up. If you don't find it, let me know. <laughs> that was last year. But there, I mean, the couple front ends is earlier also. Uh, actually, there's a paper uh, that was much earlier. It's called Fetch Directed Instruction Prefetching uh, that won the Micro Test of Time Award. I would recommend put, putting that up. So fetch directed, this is basically what you're doing is fetch directed instruction prefetching, but that could also make your data prefetching nicely. So we didn't actually talk about instruction versus data, right? Instructions versus data, these are also, also separate prefetchers, right? Usually you have separate prefetchers because the access patterns of instructions is different from access patterns of data. You can play tricks like I just described with instructions. You can decouple the front end, run the front end fast, and the instructions get prefetched based on the uh, branch prediction uh, that are made in the front end. Whereas data, you cannot do that. You need to do something like this. Uh, so this is this was one way of looking ahead in the instruction stream. Another way of looking at it in the instruction stream is okay. I see stride. Uh, uh, I see stride n. Last address reference was address I don't know uh, b. Uh, so instead of prefetching just b plus n, I prefetch b plus n, b plus two n, b plus three n, b plus four n, b plus five n. Basically, I I I, uh, I create a distance from the processor and then I keep prefetching ahead of the processor. That's the idea. But these tend to be not so easy. But existing prefetchers actually try to do that. Okay, the memory region based, based, based. Okay, I should fix this right now. Worries me a lot. Okay, there you go. <laughs> memory based, region based stride prefetching is different. I need to use a slideshow. What happened? There's something wrong with this computer, I think. I lost the pointer. Okay, it came back. Lost the point. Okay. Okay. I'm not going to touch it again. So here, uh, you don't have the load program counter. You basically see a cache block address and you look at a region uh, and you determine uh, if in that region you have a particular stride. So this cache block address belongs to a 4 kilobyte page, for example. Within this page is the next address that I'm going to see. Uh, what's the stride? And if the stride is constant within that page, for example, you basically keep prefetching ahead based on the cache block address that you've seen. That's the idea over here. It's also simple. 
it can detect strided memory access patterns that appear due to multiple instructions. Here we have nothing to do with the instruction. We're just looking at the data access patterns. Uh, you could do this with the instruction uh, access patterns also, but we're, we're just looking at the addresses. Uh, and if the addresses have strides, we don't care which instruction it's coming from, right? There's just a strike, and I should keep using that strike. That's the idea. Uh, basically, this is an example where each access could be due to a different instruction, potentially possible. So stream prefetching, stream buffers, which were one of the most influential prefetchers uh, to be developed, is a special case of memory region-based strike prefetching where n equals 1. Basically, you're streaming through memory. OK, we're going to look at that. So what are the trade-offs over here, instruction versus memory region? Uh, as I said, the latter, memory region-based stride prefetching, can exploit strides that occur due to, multiple, due to the interaction of multiple instructions. And today's data structures are sophisticated. It's not just a single load. It's many, many loads that are accessing the data structure. Uh, and the latter can, get, uh, can more easily get further ahead of the processor access stream uh, because it's actually looking at different memory regions. Uh, no need for a look at PC also, uh, like the fetch-directed prefetching that we discussed. But the latter is also more hardware intensive, actually, uh, because uh, you, you need to look at many, many memory regions to make this happen. Uh, uh, why is this more hardware intensive? Because the instruction working set size, the number of loads you have in a program, is usually much smaller than the amount of memory regions that you touch. This is basically, uh, uh, in a sense, this is obvious because the data that you touch is much larger than the number of instructions you use to touch the data with. Right? That's why we have a data bottleneck today. right? Uh, you can have a huge linked list, terabytes and terabytes, but only one load or two loads to traverse that linked list. Right? You load the address of the node, next node, and then you load the uh, data in that node. Basically, two program counters traverse the entire one terabyte linked list. That's, a, that's an example of why uh, memory region, tracking memory regions becomes much more hardware intensive. Okay, okay I think I, I've said this already. So this is a paper that introduced the instruction-based strike prefetching. You can see that it's from 1991. There were prefetchers before this, but this uh, does instruction-based strike prefetching. And you can see that instruction-based uh, strike prefetchers are actually employed in Intel processors, especially into the L1 data cache. Here they can detect uh, the data patterns better. And you can see it's kind of similar to what's employed, uh, what's, what's, kind of dis what's described here. Again, I'm not going to go into details. You can read white papers about this. This is a paper that introduced memory region-based stride prefetching, a particular form, uh, which is the stream buffers. And we're going to talk about this paper a little bit. Uh, so it's, it's what, uh, this is what uh, they proposed in this particular uh, paper. This also uh, introduced the idea of a victim cache, uh, which is a way of uh, uh, making your cache more effective. But I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, but prefetch buffers, uh, stream buffers, look like this from this paper. You have a data cache, and you have a bunch of FIFOs, first in, first out buffers, that bring data uh, into uh, for for different regions of memory, and you fill the data cache uh, top top off the data cache. Uh, if you see that your access pattern actually is going through that region of memory, that's the idea. Uh, essentially, each stream buffer holds one stream of sequentially prefetched cache lines. What you see over here is a a plus one, a plus two, a plus three, a plus four, dot dot dot. Assuming it's full, it could be the entire thing. Uh, on a load miss from the data cache, you check the head of all the stream buffers for an address match. If there's a hit, you pop the entry from the FIFO, update the cache with the data. So you bring the data from the FIFO to here. If not, you allocate a new stream, stream buffer to the new miss address. You may have to actually replace a stream buffer over here. This could be eight or 16 buffers, for example. So there needs to be a replacement policy of the streams also. Uh, basically, stream buffer FIFOs are continuously topped off with subsequent cache lines automatically, let's say. Uh, whenever there's room and the bus is not busy. So the memory actually can be pushing data into these stream buffers, assuming that, of course, the processor indicated that, uh, for example, you may be accessing address A, A plus one, A plus two, so you have some confidence. And basically, the stream buffer has some logic that says that, that, that gets the data from memory to top it off if the memory bus is not busy. So, for example, you may, you may be adding arrays, uh, elements of arrays A and B. This nicely works in that case, right? Uh, you start a stream uh, of A over here and B over here, and you get A plus 1 and B plus 1, and then A plus, uh, A plus 2 and B plus 2. These are cache blocks. So basically, you, you keep accessing consecutive cache blocks belonging to array A and array B, and they go to two different stream buffers. So if you're operating on many arrays at the same time, this works very nicely. So 
you can see that this is very simple and it's trying to uh, get the, let's say, easy uh, things to prefetch uh, out. And there's a design of the stream buffer, but I'm not going to go through it. Clearly, it's simple to implement, right? You need to just uh, increment so that you generate the next address. And there needs to be valid and tag bits clearly. And you can see that uh, in the paper. So this sort of streaming prefetchers are actually implemented a lot uh, uh, in a more sophisticated way. But the basic idea is the same. So for example, uh, this is a paper from IBM, Power4 System Microarchitecture. I would recommend looking at it. It's a bit old right now. This is one of the first multi-core systems also from 2002. Uh, but basically, you can see that uh, these, this is L0, L1, line 0, line 1, belonging to a stream. Uh, it's in uh, data cache. When, when, when it's used over here, uh, the cache, uh, uh, there, there's a prefetcher that prefetches data from L2 to L1, the next block, basically. And then there's a prefetcher that prefetches data from L3 to L2, next block, and then memory to L3. So you have streaming prefetchers that do the prefetching this way. And as a result, uh, you get the streaming pattern nicely, assuming you're streaming. They do have some stride dissection as well, but I'm not going to uh, talk about that. And you can read more, probably their patterns. OK, any questions on this? Hopefully, this is obvious. Uh, so this is a paper uh, that you can read. But this is, there's another reason that I'm showing you this paper. This is a GOP's uh, victim cache and pref uh, stream buffers paper. But you can see that uh, at the time uh, that this paper was written, 1990s, missed cost in terms of cycles, six cycles, 12 cycles. Today, we're at the order of 500 cycles or so. So you can see how memory has not kept up with the improvements in processors. I mean, we've kind of expected that. And this paper also says uh, it's expected, right? And a question mark over here, future processor, it's going to be 70 cycles, right? So that's why uh, prefetching is important. Prefetching is more, a lot more important today than uh, in the past. Okay, so let's talk about uh, a little bit more uh, sophisticated prefetchers. Uh, in many applications, access patterns are not perfectly streaming or strident. Uh, some patterns look random to close by addresses. How do you capture such accesses? So a lot of existing processors uh, use actually locality-based prefetchers. Uh, I mean, the best way it's described, it's described in this paper, so I'd recommend you take a look at it. We're going to talk about that paper uh, in a different way. But let me actually just uh, show this. Uh, this doesn't go further beyond. Fine. And you can, people can see this uh, online also, right? What do you think, Joel, Mohammed? If I write over here, can people see it? Boldly, are you sure? I mean, that's, that camera is there, right? Oh, uh, somehow we need to focus on that camera. Okay, okay, I know, I know what to do. Yeah, before I think uh, at least... On Zoom, people can see it, but I need to stop sharing. How do I make myself big? Okay, I'm talking. Okay, okay, let's get it right this time. Uh, share screen again. Okay. Oh, okay, speaker like this. Okay, yeah, yeah, I can see myself now. Wow. But I don't want to see myself over here. So if I turned off like this, will it get turned off? No. <laughs> okay, but I, I see myself over here also. So. Uh, Say it again. Honor, yeah. yeah, it may be possible for you to share the camera, actually. Share the camera. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's, a bit, that's an easier one. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So basically, uh, what happens uh, in existing processors is uh, you have an address. You get an address, A, let's say. What you do is you create a stream detector. Uh, it's not exactly a stream, actually, uh, but you detect a stream. Uh, now, it basically looks at addresses A, and uh, it, it checks maybe, depending on the design, uh, it checks addresses A minus 16, A plus 16. Okay, now you've actually got a uh, miss to A, let's say. Now you get, an, uh, you get a miss to A plus 3. We're not perfectly uh, streaming or strided. So A plus 3 looks here. Oh, the direction seems to be increasing. You set a direction equals 1. Uh, maybe you have a confidence value or no. Maybe it's incremented to 1. And then you get something to A plus, I don't know, 7. Mm, the processor is moving toward this direction, right? So direction is still positive and confidence is two. And then you get a maybe A plus four. 
And the direction is still this way, which is increasing. And you have some confidence that the processor is going to this way. At some point, you build enough confidence and uh, the processor starts saying, okay, now I have a stream over here. Uh, I should probably be prefetching this way. And I should keep generating some prefetches. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe you, you increase this to A plus 32, right? And then maybe you send a bunch of prefetches uh, to catch up or to create a distance from the demand access stream. And then uh, you start uh, sending prefetches. Maybe you send, I don't know, uh, you send 10 prefetches. I'm just making up, uh, but real systems do more sophisticated things. Uh, this way, now you actually have uh, prefetched, uh, prefetched a bunch of stuff over here in the anticipation that the processor is at some, going, at some point going to touch these, at least a fraction of these, right? Maybe not perfectly streaming. And then you move uh, the detection window. So there's also a detection window, which I didn't define. But if you read the paper, you will see that. You move the detection window from whatever uh, is somewhere over here in the middle uh, to somewhere else. Maybe you move the detection window from, I don't know, A plus 16 to A plus, uh, maybe A plus 32. I don't know. You usually increase it to A plus 40. And then if you see another access to A plus 16, uh, basically within this window, now you have some confidence that the processor is actually proceeding this way and your prefetch is actually useful. Then you start prefetching little by little. Maybe you start prefetching one more thing over here, A plus 33, right? And then the processor actually generates another access to somewhere within this window, and then you prefetch A plus 34. So you can see that uh, what's happening is you created a window, you built some confidence within the window that the processor is actually having accesses within this window, and you also created some confidence that the processor is actually going forward beyond this window, so you keep generating prefetches through that window. Now, the beauty of this prefetcher is it's not rigid. It's very, uh, uh, let's say, flexible in the sense that whatever comes within the window, assuming it's built the confidence to actually go through and prefetch uh, continuously within that window, it's, it just advances the window. It keeps prefetching. Uh, you can augment this with stride detection slightly, and existing processors actually augment it with stride detection. Uh, but this is employed in many, many existing prefetchers, including Intel Pentium 4. Uh, and uh, this is actually quite uh, more effective compared to next line prefetchers, stride prefetchers, et cetera. Does that make sense? Yes. Because you're looking at the window, right? You have a detection window, A, A plus 16. You're building confidence that it, the, 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 the accesses to different cache blocks may be reordered in the processor. You have auto order execution. Uh, you don't know why that became A plus four. It could be because of the... Uh, so basically, the, the, the key idea is that, uh, or the key assumption is that we don't know exactly the strike, but we have an indication that we're going to this direction, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's what I'm saying. That what you're considering is not the direction compared to the last instruction, what you're considering is the direction within this window. Make sense? So you're, you start at, you have a stream detector that's looking at A, uh, between a, a and A plus 16 and A minus 16. You're actually not going this way. You're still higher than A. <laughs> what would you look at? <laughs> it's a memory region, right? You got an address to miss to A. You have to start somewhere. Does that make sense? You, you got an address to, uh, uh, you get an access to add, a miss to address A, and you're trying to figure out where the processor is, what, what other potential things that the processor might touch. Uh -huh. Yeah, but why would you look at that? That's so far in, ter in terms of the access stream, right? Yeah, that goes to another window. Yeah, so if you actually get, for example, A plus 5,000, uh, okay, yeah, that's a good point, basically. If, you, uh, if the processor misses address A plus 5,000, it basically checks the stream detectors, all of the stream detectors. Clearly, it's not going to match on this one. And if there's no, uh, uh, no address, five plus, uh, address A plus 5,000 in any window, it creates another detector. And the detector is basically like this. I mean, I just picked this address, uh, A plus 4,984, right? And address A plus... 560, 5,016, or something like that, basically, something aligned. Make sense? 
So uh, the, the, the intuition is that uh, assuming there is no constant stride, and as I said, people augment this with stride detectors. The intuition is that you, if, uh, you may not detect the constant stride, and there's also a lot of noise in the out of order execution stream that you get. You just want to figure out there is a locality in the access pattern within this window and build confidence that that locality is going to go forward or backward in the access stream and prefetch ahead of the processor. Uh, in the anticipation is that in the anticipation that 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 kind of locality will going will continue. Okay, and it turns out these are actually quite powerful, except they're very bandwidth intensive uh, because sometimes you may not detect any stride, right? And you keep prefetching ahead, you may be actually generating lots of prefetches, but several of them may be used. Okay, now we're going to go back to this. So if you want to know more about this sort of prefetchers, uh, you should read that paper. Oh. Does it work now? Or you, do you still see myself? In Zoom, yes, but not in, okay. And no. What do I do now? Okay, it's good. Okay, interesting. Uh, because of this probably. Ah. Okay, yeah. Uh, so there's a lot more, of course, that goes into these, but I gave you the intuition. Uh, yeah, you can read more in the paper. And this is uh, data from Intel. Uh, this is another nice paper that talks about Pentium 4. And they basically show uh, this prefetch actually does quite well uh, on many workloads. Uh, so uh, the issue is it's very bandwidth intensive uh, because uh, clearly it looks at this window and whenever it, see, it sees an access to this window, it generates multiple prefetch requests, but not all of those requests may be used. So you can actually fix this with stride detection. You can basically still have locality-based prefetching, but uh, prioritize the strides over there. And if you're actually confident that you have a stride, then basically you abandon this window. You need to integrate it with other stride det uh, stream detection mechanisms, but I'm not going to get into that. And you can also have feedback mechanisms that we've discussed, right? If you actually have too much useless prefetching, you throttle uh, the stream. Uh, okay, the do another downside of this sort of prefetcher is it's limited to prefetching close by addresses. Uh, as I, I mean, as you have discussed, right? If you go to A plus 5,000, you're not going to predict that. Uh, but you can augment this with large stride detection. Uh, again, that complicates the prefetcher. So you need to have hybrid prefetching mechanisms, basically. And we will see that that's going to be increasingly the case. Uh, you need to have really, uh, if you really want to prefetch far away addresses, uh, you, you need to have some sort of other method. But as, as I said, they work well in real life. Uh, I myself have actually worked on some of these prefetchers in real systems, and they work quite well. You need to tune them, no question about that. And you need to also, also handle this bandwidth intensiveness because they can actually cause a lot of bandwidth. Yes. Yes, yes, it would capture it because it would have two different stream detectors, one centered around A and the other centered around A plus 5,000. It would capture both of them. Okay. 16, 32. <laughs> I mean, exact numbers, of course, confidential, but 16 and 32 are reasonable. Yeah, that's a good question, basically. That's a, in a sense, this is, if you look at this, uh, this builds on the idea of these stream buffers, but stream buffers are extremely rigid, right? It's always A, A plus one, A plus two, A plus three, there is no room for some uh, locality in the access stream that's not streaming, right? So it's basically, you can think of these, these are all stream detectors, except we made them much more flexible, also much more bandwidth intensive. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So that also exists <laughs> in processors. So yeah, if you get, if you, all of your stream detectors are full and you get some other address that doesn't belong to anyone, usually you can do LRU, least recently used. That's reasonable. But again, you may be wrong. <laughs> okay, so these are uh, still interesting patterns. And this is, now we've added a little bit more uh, irregularity to the access pattern, right? This doesn't need to have regular access patterns, but there are even more irregular access patterns as we will see. Uh, so uh, let's talk about some of them. So there's simple regular pa patterns, stride and stream prefetches work well on these. Complex regular patterns, these also exist. Multiple regular strides, how do you predict them? 
people, uh, there are actually prefetchers that try to learn these correlations between access patterns, address patterns, and there are completely irregular access patterns where you don't have the sort of strides, right? So this is, this is basically, you access address A plus one. Uh, basically, stride is basically compared to the prior address. You always uh, increment the prior cache block address by plus one, and then the prior one by plus two, plus three. These are called deltas, deltas compared to the prior access. And the delta is regular, as you can see over here, right? So this should be predictable. Of course, it requires a little bit more care. But some things are much less predictable, as you can see, right? So we're going to talk about that also. So this is uh, multi-stride detection. I'm not going to go into the details of how this is done, but you can see this is a real program because of the data structure access patterns. You have a regular repeated set of strides over here. These are called deltas again, delta pattern. Plus seven, minus six, plus 12, plus six, minus five, minus six, and then minus six. And that repeats with some irregularity in between, as you can see. Uh, so it's complex, but predictable. And people have actually developed prefetchers. This is another prefetcher from Intel. Uh, you can see that. You can read it if you want. But the key idea is given a history or signature or pattern of strides, you learn or memorize and predict what stride may come next. Uh, so for example, uh, you may look at, uh, this is a correlation-based prefetcher. You basically try to correlate multiple different past strides with the next stride that's coming. So for example, seven minus 12 is correlated with six. Whenever you see the pattern seven minus, minus six, 12, the next stride is always six. And if you can find it, design a table that captures that correlation, that's great. You're correct. That's true for this also. Whenever you see minus six, 12, and six, the next stride is going to be minus six. So this is called a delta correlation prefetcher in the end. Uh, and there's a way these works, but I'm not going to go into the details. You should really read the paper. Uh, so they have some confidence mechanism also. And they try to avoid these places where things become a little bit unpredictable in the end for, with those confidence mechanisms. So now this gives you an idea of the complexity that goes into modern prefetchers uh, because these patterns are actually real and real systems or real workloads. Okay, any questions? I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about prefetcher performance, which we kind of talked about, uh, but let's talk about this a little bit more because there are many aspects to this. Uh, we talked about accuracy. This is the fraction of uh, prefetches, uh, free fraction of sent prefetches that are actually used by the processor. Uh, we talked about coverage, which is the fraction of all cache misses that are actually prefetched by the prefetcher. And then there's a timeliness, which is a bit harder to compute exactly because timeliness is really, you can compute it based on the number of prefetches or amount of time. Uh, but this is, a, this is a number of prefetches type of computation. Uh, among all of the used prefetches, how many of them are on time? Now the question is, what is on time, right? If you actually, uh, are you strict? Did you save all of the cycles? Did you, uh, uh, what do you consider on time? You could have a fractional value for on time, right? That's, that's, now this becomes a time-based metric, potentially. Uh, so out of, for example, 500 cycles, how much did you save? Now, the problem is, of course, 500 cycles is not always 500 cycles. Sometimes you save 40 cycles. Some, sometimes you, uh, the processor would wait only 40 cycles because there's some overlap in the out-of-order execution, right? So essentially, timeliness is not perfectly uh, uh, com computable uh, because all of the metrics you come up with is not going to be perfectly correlated with uh, uh, the stall time in the end. In the end, what, you, what you're targeting with timeliness is a really stall time, right? As we have discussed earlier. And then there are other metrics like bandwidth consumption. Uh, memory bandwidth, uh, this is uh, how much extra memory bandwidth you're consuming with the prefetcher compared to without the prefetcher. Now, there's some good news. You can utilize idle bus bandwidth if, if available. This may not matter that much in terms of performance because if you, if you utilize the idle bandwidth, hopefully you're not affecting anyone else. But with the caveat that don't forget the robofers, for example, you may be affecting the robofers in DRAM. So there are, there are interference effects that goes on between the prefetcher and other requests. Um, and then there's cache pollution. Uh, this is the uh, extra demand misses due to prefetch placement in a cache, essentially. How much you're increasing the ex demand misses. This is a bit more difficult to quantify, but it does affect the uh, performance. And people have come up with quantification methods, including this paper that I'm going to talk about. So it's a multidimensional problem. And as I said, accuracy, coverage, and timeliness go against each other sometimes. Uh, so prefetcher aggressiveness affects all of the metrics. Aggressiveness is really dependent on the prefetcher type. For most hardware prefetchers, you have two things that determine the aggressiveness. Prefetch distance is how far ahead of the demand stream you are. And prefetch degree is how many prefetches do you generate for demand access, for a given demand access. So let's take a look at an example. This is an access stream, uh, hypothetical. 
you uh, access x, and there's a prediction stream that the prefetch is running ahead. So the prefetch distance is how many prefetches, um, essentially how many accesses are you ahead of the demand access tree? Again, depends on the prefetcher, right? This could be a stream prefetcher. In this case, uh, it's really the number of cache blocks. It could be a stride prefetcher. It's really the number of uh, accesses, right? And then there's a Pmax over here. So this is an aggressive prefetcher, for example. This is a very conservative prefetcher. It stays just a little bit ahead of the demand street. Okay, there could be a middle of the road prefetcher also. Okay, so let's take a look at the aggressive prefetcher. Um, let's take a look at one prefetcher. Let's, uh, let's look at the prefetch degree. So this is how far ahead you are. This is what your, what your prefetch last. Whenever you get access to X plus one, prefetch degree determines how many things you prefetch next. One thing, two things, three things. How many prefetches you generate, basically? Clearly, this affects your aggressiveness also. Okay, so hopefully these are simple. How do these metrics interact is a question, basically. Very aggressive prefetcher has a large prefetch distance and large prefetch degree, usually. Very conservative prefetcher is uh, usually has a small prefetch distance and small prefetch degree. As a result, very aggressive prefetcher is well ahead of the load access stream. It hides the memory latency better, but it's more speculative also. Whereas very conservative prefetcher might not hide the memory access latency completely because it's closer to the load access stream and it reduces the potential, but it reduces the potential for cache pollution and bandwidth contention. So there are benefits to both in the end. So if you think about it, very aggressive prefetcher usually has higher coverage and better timeliness, but it likely has lower accuracy uh, because it's very aggressive, right? It's predicting that the processor will get there, but the processor may never get there. Uh, and it also uh, creates higher bandwidth consumption and more pollution. And the opposite is true for very conservative prefetcher, right? It's likely higher accuracy, it's lower bandwidth, likely, but not always, right? Because you may actually have a predict misprediction in your algorithm. Assuming the algorithms are equal, uh, um, this likely has uh, this, uh, higher accuracy. Lower bandwidth, definitely, and less polluting. But it also has likely, uh, likely lower coverage and it's, it's like, likely less time because it's not staying far ahead of the demand access tree. So these are some workloads, and you can see, uh, you, can, you can plot these correlations. This is the correlation between prefetcher accuracy and percentage performance improvement over no prefetching. So you can see that if the prefetcher accuracy is low, there's some correlation. It depends, it's not just accuracy. This picture shows that there's some correlation, but it's not a perfect correlation. So sometimes the prefetcher accuracy is 70%, and you get a lot more performance benefits even though sometimes the prefetcher may be perfectly accurate and you get, I don't know, 5% performance benefit over here, maybe 10%. But you lose a lot over here in some cases, as you can see, right? So there's some correlation between these metrics. And these, these are more, let's say, sophisticated results uh, where we look at no prefetching, uh, very conservative prefetching, and middle of the road prefetching, and very aggressive prefetching on a Pentium 4-like stream prefetcher, again. Uh, and you can see that... Uh, in all cases, you improve performance actually compared to no prefetching. That's good. But some workloads, uh, in many workloads, uh, increasing the aggressiveness of the prefetcher is good. You can see that. Uh, and on average, you actually get significant performance improvements as you increase the aggressiveness of the prefetcher, but it ta uh, tapers off as you make it very, very aggressive. But in some workloads, as you make the prefetcher more aggressive, you lose performance improvement. So you can see that very aggressive prefetchers don't work well for all workloads. It makes sense, hopefully. Uh, so the idea is many, many systems today actually implement uh, some sort of feedback-directed prefetcher throttling. Uh, the idea is to dynamically monitor the prefetcher performance metrics and throttle the prefetcher aggressiveness up or down. This is very similar to source throttling, except here your source is the prefetcher, right? Uh, the, the, the prefetcher is a source of memory requests. You'll throttle the aggressiveness of the prefetcher. And also, you change the location of prefetches that are inserted in the cache lines based on the past performance of the prefetcher. So let's just give it, take an, an example. Uh, you have a high accuracy prefetcher that's not late, but it's polluting. You may decide to decrease the aggressiveness. You have a high accuracy prefetcher that's late. You may want to increase the aggressiveness so that it becomes less late. Right? Here, you're trying to prevent pollution. Here, you're trying to increase timeliness. You may have a medium accuracy prefetcher that's not polluting, that's late. You may want to increase the aggressiveness so that it's not late, right? Because it's not polluting, it's reasonably accurate. But you may have a medium accuracy prefetcher that's polluting, you may want to decrease the aggressiveness. So these are some human designed heuristics uh, to throttle the prefetchers, right? A lot of systems have that. Increasingly, machine learning may be used to actually decide which heuristics are better. 
And if you actually do this, you get much better performance uh, improvements. Uh, uh, so this is basically no prefetching and very aggressive prefetching. Compa if you actually use feedback directed uh, prefetching, you get higher average performance improvements, and you actually curb the downsides uh, that you see in some workloads. So having this feedback directed prefetching gets you higher performance than a statically configured prefetcher. Uh, sometimes it gets you lower performance than the best one, but uh, that's a trade-off also, right? Okay, so you can actually see that uh, in this work. Uh, and then there's also bandwidth consumption. If you actually, throttling actually affects your bandwidth consumption a lot, uh, as I will show you. Uh, if you define your bandwidth consumption as memory bus access per 1,000 instructions, uh, this clearly includes the effect of L2 demand misses as well as pollution misses and prefetches. It's a me measure of bus bandwidth usage. And these are some numbers, for example. Uh, uh, Let's take a look at FDP. These are this feedback direct prefetching and very aggressive prefetcher. So you can see that the very aggressive prefetcher is uh, highly bandwidth consuming, uh, but you can actually increase the performance compared to a very aggressive prefetcher, which is the best over here, while having less bandwidth consumption. So uh, this is going to be increasingly important into the future. Uh, the amount of performance improvement you get per uh, amount of bandwidth consumed. That's an interesting metric to optimize. And this is one of the first works that's trying to optimize those. Now we'll see later works uh, that try to make this even better. Basically, you can have a, uh, the, the goal is to make the prefetcher work on the old bandwidth configurations. Whether you have limited bandwidth or ample bandwidth, your prefetcher should work nicely. Why is this a problem? Again, because, of, uh, because you may actually be running with other workloads in the system, right? Or you may actually be designed for different kinds of systems. So we will see that later on again. But this sort of throttling mechanism is actually good for both performance as well as bandwidth consumption, as you can see. And you can see that the no prefetching has uh, some bandwidth consumption to begin with. So you can see the overhead of the very aggressive prefetch. It's quite significant, right? Whereas FTP uh, reduces that overhead quite significantly also. Okay, so uh, you can read more about this. Uh, now, this is interesting because when we did the study for the first time, this was for single core systems. Once you go into multi-core, uh, the whole landscape changes because now you have interference. And what you think may be a good decision uh, based on this may not be a good decision anymore. And that's what uh, later papers uh, actually show. I mean, we, hopefully that's kind of obvious to you by now because we talked a lot about memory interference. Uh, basically, if you really want to control or throttle prefetchers in a multi-core system uh, because of the interference that prefetchers cause to each other as well as demand requests, of other processors, you really need to take that into account. You cannot just look at local metrics. And that's the idea in this work. You cannot just look at local accuracy, lateness, and pollution. That's not enough. You have to take into account the interference that you're causing to others and interference you may be receiving. And that's what this uh, later paper does. So uh, in a multi-core system, you really need to be a little bit more intelligent, let's say. But I'm not going to go into that. Okay, maybe this is a good time to uh, take a break, let's say. Let me see. I think it's a good time to take a break. Any questions before we take a break? Now, uh, so okay, after the break, we're going to go into uh, a lot less regular access patterns. So let's take a break until uh, 3 p.m. Uh, so you have more time to stretch. We'll continue with many interesting ideas.
Okay, is this better? Is it is it good on Zoom also? Let me see. Okay, I think I can see myself over here uh, speaking. So let's get started. Uh, we're going to have some more fun with prefetching. There's one question I think over here that says whether reinforcement learning based algorithm can be used for throttling. I think a lot of these decisions can be made uh, better with machine learning, and we will discuss that. Uh, I think that's a very open area of research. We will see one prefetcher that uses reinforcement learning principles, uh, which is going to be uh, important, I think, because some of these patterns, uh, these patterns are getting much more complex uh, to detect. Easy, easy patterns are detected already. So easy, let's say, uh, the low-hanging fruit in prefetching is gone. People now need to detect much more uh, irregular patterns. That's what we're going to talk about now, actually. Uh, how do you detect more irregular access patterns? So for regular patterns, stride stream prefetchers or locality-based prefetchers do well. But where they, where they fail is really these irregular access patterns, indirect area accesses, linked data structures. I mean, we kind of discussed multiple regular strides, so that should actually be classified earlier. Random patterns. Uh, so we're going to talk about some prefetchers, correlation-based prefetchers, content-directed prefetchers, and pre-computation or execution-based prefetchers. As I said, there's a lot of room for creativity over here. So address correlation-based prefetching was developed in the 1990s. Uh, and if you look at the following history of cache block addresses, you can represent uh, this as a Markov graph. Basically, after referencing a particular address, uh, some addresses are more likely to be referenced next. And you can represent this with a Markov model that uh, connects uh, the addresses uh, with probabilities. Uh, in, the, in the graph, basically, you have an... Uh, you have an edge from one node to another. If the uh, node, if the next node follows the prior node in this history of accesses, and you also have a probability, so it's a weighted edge. With what probability do you get B after you see A uh, is the uh, weight of the node essentially? So this is called a Markov model or a Markov graph, and a processor can dynamically form this uh, graph clearly, including the probabilities. Of course, the probabilities may be dynamically changing, and build some confidence as to which addresses follow which other addresses. And these addresses do not have any pattern, right? It could be completely uh, randomly chosen from the address space. Basically, there may be no relationship at all uh, that you gather uh, between these addresses. Make sense? Uh, so that's the idea. Uh, it's a very powerful idea, and this is called address correlation-based prefetching. In fact, uh, the delta correlation prefetchers that we briefly discussed work based on uh, this sort of idea also. Uh, basically, you correlate a number of deltas, maybe one delta with the next delta, or three previous deltas with the next delta, or three previous deltas with three next deltas, for example. There, there could be variations. And uh, the idea is to record the likely next addresses after seeing one address, or multiple addresses, as I said. Uh, for example, in this particular case, the likely next addresses after you see A are B, C, and D. You can see that over here, right? B, C, D, B, C, D, B, C, D, multiple times. Uh, next time A is accessed, prefetch B, C, D. And A is said to be correlated with B, C, D. Okay, so there's a design space, of course, how many, ac how many addresses you correlate with how many next addresses, how many uh, seen addresses you correlate with how many next addresses, like the next addresses. And people have looked at the design space over decades, if you will. This was introduced in this paper, but there's concurrent work uh, from Mark Charney that does essentially the same thing also. He didn't publish it. It's in his technical report. Uh, and then uh, you, can you can actually increase coverage by prefetching up to next n addresses, uh, as opposed to just the next one, right? Because if you just prefetch the next one, it may not be good for coverage. You increase coverage by looking further. Uh, timeliness could be an issue. Uh, 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 so for timeliness, you actually, uh, in, uh, prefetching up to next n addresses also helps timeliness or correlating further ahead in the future. So prefetch accuracy can be improved by using multiple addresses as key for the next address. Again, you have A and B as the current addresses, and that could be correlated with C. Uh, you have to see A and B together to decide whether you want to prefetch C, basically. A is not enough, B is not enough. It's in combination. You have to see them. So this actually improves accuracy. It may reduce coverage, clearly. Okay, so there are a bunch of variations which we're not going to go over. And these are also called Markov prefetchers. So these are a different kind of beast, if you will. So the, now this can cover arbitrary access patterns, right? Linked data structures, for example. If you're traversing a linked list, 
And the, the, all of the nodes are random locations in the memory address space, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. If you're traversing the linked list again, now you captured all of those correlations. So you can actually, the next time you traverse the linked list, assuming things have not changed, you can get perfect 100% uh, prefetching accuracy and also coverage uh, when you actually uh, employ this. Uh, of course, other linked data structures uh, are also very hard to predict. If you can have a graph, for example, or a tree, uh, and if you're traversing the same part of the graph again, you can actually uh, get uh, uh, highly accurate prefetches uh, out of this. So linked data structures work well for this sort of prefetching. Uh, but of course, accuracy may uh, depend, right? Depending on whether, you're perfect, uh, whether you have seen this part of the graph, uh, coverage also depends uh, uh, whether you have seen this part of the graph. So to be able to prefetch something, you have to have seen it uh, for this to work, which is different from a streaming prefetch or a stride-based prefetch. Right? Uh, so linked data structures are a very good, good example. Uh, streaming patterns, actually, you can actually also prefetch these, right? Although not so efficiently. For example, uh, if you have, uh, if you're doing address a plus one, a plus two, a plus three, a plus four, a plus five, a plus six, you actually you can actually correlate. After you see address a, the next thing you correlate is address a plus one. After you see address a plus one, the next thing you see is address a plus two. So clearly, there's a correlation over here. Now, unfortunately, this is very, very hardware intensive. It's a lot easier to capture streaming or striding patterns with just a stride detector or a stream prefetcher, right? You can also do it with address correlation-based prefetching, but you may have timeliness issues, coverage issues, et cetera. But you can do it. Uh, now, disadvantage is uh, kind of uh, obvious maybe after this discussion, but correlation table, which is essentially the table that stores the correlation between addresses, needs to be large for uh, high coverage. So imagine, for example, the example that I gave, gave you earlier, one terabyte linked list. One terabyte linked list doesn't sound very good, right? <laughs> Clearly, you should not program that way. But assuming uh, with this exaggeration, uh, if you really want to cover the, the entire uh, misses in that linked list, your correlation table needs to be huge. And this is always a problem with this sort of uh, prefetch. Recording every miss address and subsequent miss addresses is really infeasible. And uh, it's a difficult problem to solve. Uh, people have uh, designed a lot of correlation prefetchers. Uh, and if you don't have a lot of predictability and your data set is large, then you have a problem. Can have low timeliness. Look at it is limited because a prefetch for the next access or miss is initiated right after the previous. But we know how to solve this. You, you prefetch uh, not just the next address, but many, many next addresses, as we have done earlier. But still, once you go into many, many next addresses, your aggressiveness increases. So you're back to the aggressiveness, timeliness trade off. They can consume a lot of memory bandwidth, especially when the probabilities, these correlations are relatively low. Uh, and cannot reduce compulsory misses. So compared to uh, streaming and striding prefetchers, I already said this, but uh, you have to have seen the address before, uh, unless you do delta correlation. So delta correlation is a special case of uh, this address correlation prefetchers. You don't store the missed addresses, you just store the deltas. Now, once you go into the delta space, uh, you're actually not tracking absolute addresses, you're just tracking deltas. Uh, so if you do delta correlation, you can actually reduce the com uh, compulsory misses. But as it's proposed, if you just uh, track absolute addresses, you cannot reduce compulsory misses. So it's always good to go to the delta space, if you will, if you're in the prefetch uh, design space. Okay, any questions on this? Okay, so uh, I should say that uh, address-based uh, correlation prefetchers are usually not employed because of these downsides, but they influence the delta correlation prefetchers significantly, which are heavily employed in existing systems. So there's another idea, which is actually quite clever, I think. Uh, as I said, it's an area where you can actually exercise your creativity uh, quite well. And I believe, uh, but I cannot confirm, uh, uh, that uh, I believe this is a ver versions of this are employed in real systems too. Uh, basically, uh, the goal of content-directed prefetching is to design a specialized prefetcher for pointer values, this, which is a really hard problem, as we discussed. And the idea is very nice and simple. Identify pointers among all values in a fetch cache block and issue prefetch requests for them. So you, pre, you, 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 you fetch the cache block, demand fetched or prefetched, doesn't matter. You scan the cache block to see pointers. And if you find a pointer, which is a virtual address, you basically say, okay, I'm gonna fetch from that address and use that as a prefetch. So that's the idea. It's a nice idea and it's introduced in this paper. Uh, and the beauty of this is 
it's stateless, as, as the title also suggests, right? You don't need to memorize or record any past address for this to work. You just scan the cache line, that, the cache block that you fetched. It can eliminate compulsory misses, never seen pointers, basically. So it gets rid of a lot of the problems with address correlation-based prefetching, yet it still operates based on addresses, not deltas. So it doesn't have the downside of delta predictability. Delta correlation-based prefetchers require predictability in deltas. Here, you may have no predictability at all, but you see a pointer and you say, we prefetch it, and then the processor is going to touch it at some point, hopefully. So that's, it has actually a very big plus. But the downside is, at least it was proposed uh, to indiscriminately prefetch all pointers in a cache block. We're going to see refining this uh, later on. Uh, this may not be good because not all pointers are useful. Uh, of course, there's an interesting question over here, which is how do you identify pointer addresses? And this is another uh, place where this paper contributes creatively. And the idea is to compare the address size values within a cache block with the address of the cache block. If the most significant few bits match, then declare that it's a pointer. And I'm going to show you with this an example. So let's assume that you got this cache block. Uh, you, you send this address to memory. The processor is waiting for it. And it comes back. And this is essentially your cache block, right? And then let's assume that you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight different address sized values. What you do is you compare, this is the address of the cache block. You compare a fraction of the most significant bits, let's say top 12 bits of the address of the cache block to the addresses, uh, to, to the values that you have over here. And if the top, let's say 12 bits match, then you declare that this is a pointer. It has to be done in the virtual address space, assuming virtual memory, right? So this has to be a virtual address because pointers are virtually addressed, right? Unless you're operating, of course, on physical space, but the assumption is that these are programs written by most programmers. So these are virtual addresses. So this is the virtual address of the cache block and this is top 12 bits match. That's an indicator that, oh, this looks like an address, right? which is quite clever, I think. This doesn't require the programming language to specify to the ISA that this is a pointer. That's another way of doing it. Another way of doing it is basically in the programming language, you clearly know what's a pointer. Well, maybe not always, depending on the programming language, but in at least managed languages, you know what it is. And in C, you can guess most of the time. Although in C, you can arbitrarily use anything as a pointer, right? That's the downside, right? <laughs> of those, those type of languages, those type of unsafe languages. Uh, but uh, you, can, you can basically do that in a language. A compiler says, okay, this uh, variable is a pointer and that data location stores a pointer now and I'm going to mark it with one. And that one indicates that that's a pointer and you can use it. But that in, introduces a lot of overheads uh, to the ISA as well as uh, to the memory because you need to store those bits somewhere. Uh, here, uh, you don't need any of that. You basically match the top N bits of the virtual address of the cache block to the top N bits on of any address sized value inside the cache block. So in this particular case, this doesn't match, you can see that. And these uh, emptiness is, I'm just ignoring those values over there because they don't match. So there's only one pointer in this particular case, as you can see. And then you generate a prefetch for that address. It goes to the virtual address translation. It goes to the cache hierarchy. And if it's a miss, that's good. And if, well, that may not be good, right? If it's a miss, you bring it into the prefetch buffer or the caches. And then if the processor needs that address later on, if it dereferences that pointer, you save the miss, basically. Now, the downside over here is hardware does not have enough information on pointers, uh, and software does, and it can profile to get more information. So we analyze these content prefetches a lot, actually, uh, and we, we found a way of making them efficient. Of course, this requires more hardware-software cooperation. And the idea is to have the compiler profile or analyze the code and provide hints as to which pointer addresses are likely to useful likely useful to prefetch. And the hardware used these hints to prefetch only likely useful pointers. This could be encoded in a load instruction. So we have a special encoding in a load instruction. Just let me give you a, a very, very quick intuition over here. So this is a real uh, minimum spanning tree computation. Uh, for, and there's a hash table over here. And you can see that uh, each hash table bucket uh, has a linked list of keys. Uh, and you, when you, whenever you do a hash lookup, uh, you basically f uh, go to a bucket. And within that bucket, you do a linked list traversal. And if you look at this linked list traversal, uh, this is how the data structure uh, is laid out. Uh, if you look at uh, these accesses, uh, what you, the expectation is that you go to the next node, meaning next key. So this, 
there's, a, there's something that's stored here that's a pointer to the next key. But there are also two other pointers, pointers to two data elements in this particular case. And you can see that data element two is never accessed over here. So that pointer, prefetching that pointer is not going to be useful, at least in this particular piece of the code. And the data element one is going to be useful only if the key matches the key that you're looking for, which is probably a lower probability than the key not matching the key you're looking for, right? So what makes sense if you look at the structure of this program, and you could also get this information via profiling, you could do it with program analysis also potentially, but you need to have some intuition as to the profile of the code. But basically what makes sense is if you see a pointer to the next key, that's probably a good idea to prefetch because in all likelihood, you're going to go to the next key if you don't stop at this key. But probably D1 and D2 pointers are not good to prefetch because, you know, well, certainly you know that D2 is not referenced in this particular piece of the code and D1 is very unlikely to be referenced. So that's the idea basically. By looking at the structure of the program or by profiling the program, you can figure out which pointers are more likely to be used. And, okay, there's some animation issues over here, which I couldn't fix, but this is, let's take a look at uh, contact directed prefetching. This is the layout of these nodes over here. Key, data one pointer, data two pointer, and then next pointer, next key, basically. And then the key, data one pointer, data two pointer, and the next point. So if you actually do content rate prefetching as proposed, you're going to prefetch data one pointer, data two pointer, next pointer, addresses, basically. And then data one pointer, data two pointer, and the next pointer for the next entry in the hash table. That's assuming the data layout is this way in the cache block. So you're, you're going to prefetch six things. But probably only uh, the keys are useful. Or next ones are useful. Basically, if you actually uh, do this, I don't know if there's something wrong with the animations over here. Basically, you should really prefetch just the next pointers. That's the idea over here. And the beauty of this is, as you can see, you can basically prefetch as many next pointers as fits in the cache block. So you can actually prefetch a lot ahead. You've basically broken the dependence uh, that you normally have in the computation. Just by looking at the data, you've broken the dependence. So the way, another way of improving the performance of this sort of prefetcher is packing as many nexts in a cache block as possible, right? So basically separating the data structure somehow uh, so that nexts are packed, uh, keys are packed in some other place, D1s are packed in some other place, D2s are packed in some other place. That way you basically focus only on the nexts. Right? Hopefully this makes sense. Okay. So yeah, you can see that uh, there's more in this paper, but this basic paper basically makes content rate prefetching a lot more efficient. As we will see, it introduces some other ideas like hybrid prefetching because content rate prefetching by alone is not good enough. You really need to couple it with some other prefetchers. Okay. And that's the idea of hybrid hardware prefetchers basically. Use multiple prefetchers to cover many memory access patterns. Before that, any questions on content rate prefetching? Okay. Cool. I believe that we can actually have similar ideas going forward, by the way. This was developed in 2002, and I believe it was one of the most creative ideas in prefetching because it really breaks a difficult problem in a very simple way. If you think about it, linked data structures, these irregular access are very difficult problems. People have actually developed a lot of techniques to solve it. And someone comes along, says content directed prefetching. Very simple, right? Maybe it doesn't perfectly work in the first, let's say, first cut at it because it's very bandwidth intensive, but over time, people can refine the idea and make it work. Okay, hybrid prefetchers. Uh, I mean, the idea is obvious. You use multiple prefetchers to cover memory access patterns. You get better prefetch coverage. That's the goal, to cover many memory access patterns because stream prefetchers are good for some things, write prefetchers are good for something else, content rate prefetching is good for something else. Put them together. Clearly, you can have better timeliness also potentially, but you get more complexity clearly, many optimization and design decisions. You are more bandwidth intensive. And prefetchers also interfere with each other. Never forget that. Uh, and you need to manage accesses from each prefetcher somehow. And the pre prior paper that I mentioned over here looks at managing accesses between content direct prefetching and stream prefetching, for example. Okay, so I, I went through this relatively fast because it's kind of obvious, right? And existing systems have many different types of prefetchers concurrently. Okay, let me quickly go over multi-core issues. Uh, I'm not going to talk a whole lot over here, uh, but real systems need to deal with it. Uh, shared data, for example, when one core prefetches shared data from another core, uh, that may not be a good thing <laughs> because that other core may need it. And uh, when that other core needs it, it, you, uh, it gets a coherence miss. So you actually cause data moments. So you need to be a little bit more careful with shared data and locks. Uh, so you may actually prefetch the lock, uh, 
many, many, um, like many, uh, many cores may prefetch the lock because they may be executing similar pieces of code, but only one of them is going to get it, right? So it could cause invalidations in all of the cores. Basically, it can cause a lot of coherence traffic. Even if it's, it may not be coherence miss, but it could be coherence traffic to invalidate uh, the data. And we will see coherence later on. So uh, basically, in a, in a real system, you need to take into account these overheads also. That doesn't exist in a single core system. If you're just looking at single core, you don't think about coherence that much. But multi-core, you think about coherence. Prefetching efficiency becomes a lot more important, obviously, because uh, your bus bandwidth is much more precious and cache space is much more valuable. You don't want to waste those resources. Uh, and one core's prefetches interfere with other core's requests, both inside the caches as well as uh, in the memory. Uh, so you can have cache conflicts, bus contention, and all of the conflicts that we discussed in the DRAM uh, level. You need to be more careful about that. In fact, well, one core's prefetches can... Is, uh, uh, kick out demands from some other core. Uh, one core's demands can kick out useful prefetches from some other core. So there's also that other aspect. So you need to be careful with this. And this paper uh, covers some of that. So you need to design very bandwidth efficient prefetchers. And coordinated control, we mentioned that. You need to coordinate uh, uh, through all the prefetches in a coordinated manner. And there's a lot more in this area where you need to be very careful in managing the resources. And we've kind of discussed this earlier. How do you do the scheduling in memory controllers? But there's a lot more issues, basically. It becomes interesting to tackle this. OK, so there's a lot of work on prefetching aware cache management. This work actually has a nice survey in the related work. If you're interested, I'd recommend looking at it. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about it. And then and one other thing I'm not going to talk about is prefetching in GPUs. It's actually interesting because GPUs increasingly execute uh, more, and, uh, mm, uh, more and more irregular loads. Uh, but they, they also have an interesting scheduling mechanism, hardware thread scheduling mechanisms. And you need to really coordinate the thread scheduler with the prefetcher if you really want to get the most out of a GPU. But again, I'm not going to talk about that. Any questions? Yes, please. Sure. OK, sure. Yeah, then you don't, tell, you don't see the pointers, basically. Yeah, then it doesn't work. Uh, what you could do, I mean, an advanced version of this could scan the cache, right? Potentially. Maybe there are some other cache blocks that you have uh, that have pointers, right? But yes, if, ideally, as I said, you, need to, you want to pack pointers as much as possible to the cache blocks. Make sense? <laughs> but yeah, if you don't see pointers in your cache block, this idea doesn't work. Another idea could be, uh, now I may be giving out a bit more, but you could actually potentially scan part of your memory, right? Like memory regions. If you actually do this on the row offers, you could actually uh, scan a bigger chunk of the memory and find pointers over there. So it makes sense actually push, to push some of these prefetching mechanisms out into the memory side a little bit, even in a compute-centric system. <laughs> even though your goal is to process data in the uh, processor, you may have a prefetcher closer to the row buffer that's identifying pointers and sending them back, right? Yeah. Okay, any other questions? So there's a lot more room for improvement over here. And again, creativity. Uh, let me talk about self-optimizing prefetchers. We're gonna have a more research lecture on this, so I don't wanna cover uh, a lot on this. Rahul is going to give uh, a research lecture on multiple of these works, but uh, this uh, work uh, introduces the first realizable reinforcement learning-based prefetcher. And it targets multiple problems. Uh, as you have seen, prefetchers usually use one type of program context information, like program counter, right? Uh, they don't use many things. Uh, so they're not very complex uh, uh, in terms of what kind of program information they use to do the prediction. Uh, they lack inherent system awareness in general. Feedback-directed prefetching throttling actually adds inherent system awareness, but it's not baked into the algorithm itself. Uh, it's, it's kind of uh, feedback-directed prefetching can be employed with any prefetcher, basically. You just need to customize it slightly uh, to the prefetcher. And also, in silicon, they are not customizable easily, uh, meaning you have, you have actually created this prefetcher. It's very difficult to tune it for different workloads dynamically, for example. So this work tackles these three aspects. And basically, it introduces, these are Rahul's pictures, not mine. <laughs> You can see that it's not my style, right? <laughs> I'm not going to uh, put whatever that is. Uh, what is that, by the way? Maybe you guys know better than me. It's a transformer. Okay. What is there a specific name for it? It's just a transformer. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> it's not transformer like, I don't know, <laughs> Mike. <laughs> okay. But basically, the idea is to autonomously learn uh, to prefetch using different program context information and system level feedback. And you can, uh, you can customize it to the application category that's running uh, on the fly without changing the hardware. And the way we're going to do it is by changing the reward values and reinforcement learning. So we've seen reinforcement learning earlier, so I'm not going to go through this. Basically, you have an agent interacting with the environment. In a given state, it takes an action, and we see the reward. And over time, it tries to maximize its long-term rewards by picking the best action that maximizes your long-term reward in a given state. That's the idea. And here, we're going to use Q-learning, which is a form of reinforcement learning. For every state action pair, you store a Q value, just like we discussed earlier in uh, uh, reinforcement learning-based memory schedulers. And this represents the expected return or reward for taking an action in a state. And given a state, you select the action that provides the highest Q value. So basically, prefetcher can be thought of it this way, uh, this way as an agent. It observes features of a memory request to address A, for example, program counter, but it could be other stuff also, as we will see. And then it uh, prefetches uh, an offset, uh, an address, which is com computed as address A plus offset O. And then it receives a reward. And over time, it figures out what offsets to use, depending on what uh, addresses and the, and, the, and the features. OK, that's the idea, to maximize the rewards. So then the question is, of course, what a, what a, what a state, reward, and action. I will not go into this in a lot of detail. Rahul will give a longer lecture. But basically, uh, again, you can use uh, design space exploration to figure out what kind of state could be useful, program counter. You can include branch information because that could be useful for prefetching potentially. Which branch you have executed recently could be useful for determining the context of the program in terms of what your offset should be. In fact, that's actually very useful information that many prefetchers don't take into account uh, because that determines which, which data structure. Uh, so a branch, for example, can determine which field in a data structure you may access, right? If this is the case, access this field. If that's, uh, otherwise, access this other field. That's directly correlated with the offset that you're touching uh, with the next load, right? So basically, you can actually have a more sophisticated context. And then there, there could be data flow, like cache block address, what is the physical page number, deltas, deltas. Deltas are always useful. But basically, this is your vector of features. That's state. What is your action? As, I, as we constrain the problem, uh, this, uh, this makes it implementable. We're constraining the problem to predict uh, an offset, basically. Uh, this may not be the most, let's say, highest coverage prefetcher because you're really restricting your action space to a range uh, like this, right? Offset of minus 63 to plus 63, which, which is essentially a four kilobyte page. And you're trying to figure out which offsets should you prefetch next in that four kilobyte page. Okay, a zero offset means that no prefetch is generated. So it's always good to have an option for no prefetch as well. And then you can prune the action space by design space exploration. And you, you can ask your whole about that. What is reward? This is actually very important. Uh, basically, this, is, this really defines the objective of this sort of prefetcher, as we have discussed with memory controllers also. And uh, in this particular case, reward as encapsulates prefetch usefulness, whether it's accurate, late, or out of page. Uh, and system level feedback also. In this particular case, it uses memory bandwidth usage. So both of these are part of the reward function, as we will see in the next slide. But it could be expanded also, potentially. So for example, there are seven different reward levels you have based on, the, uh, based on what happens to the thing that you have prefetched. Right? It could be accurate and timely. You get some reward. These are numerical rewards that you get, because clearly you're going to update a numerical Q value. Right? It could be accurate, but late, you get some other reward. It could, be, uh, it could be losing coverage. You get some other reward. And for inaccurate prefetches, you get different kind of reward based on the bandwidth usage that happened at that particular time. Right? And then for no prefetch, again, you get different rewards based on the bandwidth usage. So you basically take into account the bandwidth usage to direct maybe, uh, maybe no prefetching with low memory usage. It's OK. Uh, well, uh, maybe it's not OK, right? But no prefetching with high memory usage is OK. Right, because that way you're actually not, are not disturbing memory. But if you are not prefetching and you have low memory bandwidth usage, maybe you should be a little bit more aggressive. Try something. Right. So that basically, this gives you different indications uh, of what you should be doing into the future. And then your values are set using automatic design space exploration. And then, as I said, this can be customized further in silicon. Basically, how much uh, positive reward or negative reward you give 
to these different reward levels or what kind of other reward levels you consider uh, can be customized in silicon. Uh, for example, if, if you're in an environment where bandwidth is extremely scarce, you would customize uh, these uh, reward levels such that uh, the, uh, it sets the goal to uh, preserve bandwidth as much as possible. Right? It reduces the aggressiveness somehow. Okay, so this is uh, what is pre uh, this is the basic PTA configuration in the paper. You can see that, and then you can also talk to Rahul later on. And more detailed, I'm not going to go into this again, but basically when you get a demand request. Uh, you check uh, a state vector and you look up uh, the Q value store. And that basically, uh, you find the action with the maximum Q value. And that gives you an offset, basically. And you generate a prefetch into the memory hierarchy. And then you prefetch, insert the prefetch action into this evaluation queue. And that action basically stays over there until you get some feedback from the system as to whether that was a good prefetch or a bad prefetch, accurate or not accurate. Uh, and then when it's evicted over here, you update the Q value store over here. You could actually do it earlier, but. Uh, there are some design considerations over here. Whenever a prefetch gets filled, you set the fill bit over here. Okay, basically you need to keep track of what's happening to the prefetch so that you can determine whether it's accurate or not accurate, right? But that's obvious because we did that for uh, throttling prefetches also. So it's not adding too much hardware, except there's this stuff that's added uh, to do reinforcement learning. Okay, so this is simulated and you can see that uh, prefetching field is alive and well. Uh, this paper was published in 2021 and there's some a bunch of state-of-the-art prefetchers uh, that are published relatively recently over here, as you can see. And this paper compares to all of them. It basically shows that uh, uh, at all core counts, PTA is actually doing better. Uh, and it's gain increased with core count. And this is uh, what I was mentioning earlier, right? You really want to design a prefetcher that's very bandwidth efficient across different bandwidth levels. This is DRAM mega transactions per second in log scale from left to right. Uh, and you can actually evaluate this in a real system clearly uh, using some workloads. And this is performance improvement over no prefetching. This is very, very bandwidth constrained system. So there are systems actually that are like that uh, per core. This per core bandwidth and AMD has something like that. Our baseline is over here. So it's, it has ample bandwidth. Uh, Intel, Intel, Xeon, whatever is like that also. You can see that the real systems are actually at different places over here, depending on what they're used for. But uh, uh, this shows that PTA is actually uh, quite bandwidth efficient compared to other prefetchers. So it's actually better than uh, the best prefetcher at different bandwidth values. So di different prefetchers change in terms of whether they're best or worst at different bandwidth values. Okay, so it's interesting basically. You want to be bandwidth efficient. And this is one of the more bandwidth efficient prefetchers. Okay, and this is open source, so you can actually do it. When are we releasing the prefetching lab? We're not sure, okay. <laughs> it's going to be sometime, right? Sometime soon. Okay, you know? Okay, I cannot see. Yeah, you said something or? Okay, okay, I, okay. But basically we have introduced a prefetching lab a couple of years ago, right? I think a few years ago. And yeah, you will get, uh, you'll have fun with the uh, prefetching lab also. Okay, so there's a lot more, but you'll uh, later hear from Rahul. Rahul will also talk about this, uh, which is not prefetching, uh, but basically avoiding the lookups in the cache hierarchy so that you can actually get to the memory faster. In a sense, it's, yeah, it's not prefetching in the sense, but in a sense, it's uh, a form of getting to the memory faster, reducing memory latency in a different way. So, because you already know the address that you want, uh, but you want to get to that address faster by avoiding a lookup in the memory hierarchy if you, know, if you think that that address is going to miss in the hierarchy. That's the idea over here. And for this, uh, uh, there's a perceptron-based off-chip load prediction mechanism. But again, I'm not going to talk about that. Any questions on these? Uh, you can see that now machine learning-based mechanisms are actually uh, becoming more and more interesting in recent works, as they should be, in my opinion. <laughs> I've been preaching these mechanisms before people started doing machine learning in prefetching. <laughs> okay, let's talk about execution-based prefetching. Uh, so this is completely different, as I said. The idea is pre-execute a piece of the program, perhaps a prune piece of the program, solely for prefetching data. And you can, only need to, uh, you can only distill the pieces of the program that lead to cache misses. So you can actually look at the program, there's an instruction stream, uh, dynamic or static, and you try to figure out what part of the program should I execute to actually prefetch this particular thing that is going to miss in the cache. That's the idea. 
So for this, normally you construct a speculative thread. This is the pre-executed program piece. It can be considered a thread. Sometimes it's a real thread that's actually launched by the programmer. Speculative thread can be executed on a separate processor or core on a separate hardware thread context, uh, like fine-grained multi-threading, or on the same thread context in idle cycle, like Renhead execution does. Or you can actually schedule the thread inside. Uh, so there could be a multi-threading that you can do within the same context also. So how do you there are many questions over here. How do you construct the speculative thread? You could have a software doing this, uh, either the programmer or the compiler, and insert the thread at an appropriate place using a spawn instruction. Spawn the thread that will do the prefetching. And hopefully, while it's prefetching, the program is doing something else. When the program needs the data, this prefetch data is already there. That's the idea. Hardware can do exactly the same thing. It's more hardware cost, of course. Or you use the original program without constructing something new, but execute it faster without stalling and correctness constraints, like runhead execution does. So basically, there are, there's a lot of room for creativity over here also. So speculative threads. But, but in all cases, if you really want to be successful in speculative thread, uh, in the speculative thread, you have to discover misses before the main program. Because if you don't do that, if you actually get to the miss uh, later than the main program, then you wasted a lot of execution, right? You're executing some thread to get to the cache miss, but you didn't accomplish your task, right? So for this, you need to avoid waiting or stalling or compute less, ideally both. So this speculative thread needs to be carefully constructed and it should really run like a blaze. It should not wait much because it needs to get ahead of the main thread, right? Uh, so to get ahead of the main thread, you usually perform only address generation computation, important brand prediction, and value prediction potentially because how do you get ahead of the main thread if you don't have a value available, right? You have this program dependence chain and that leads to a cache miss. You're trying to execute that early. Main thread didn't reach there yet. And you may not have some values available. So you need to predict them basically somehow. So you, you resort to these things so that you can actually guess what may be happening. So this is purely speculative. So there is no need for recovery of the main program if the speculative thread is incorrect. This should not affect your architectural correctness. This should not be visible to the software in the end. I mean, you may be, it may be programmed in the software, but the results it generates should not affect the main program at all. It's just to purely speed up the main program. So that's the idea. In that sense, there's some flexibility. But if you're wrong, you're wasting a lot of resources, as I said. So this, is, uh, this idea has been, ex uh, has been actually looked at, uh, as you can see, uh, more than 20 years ago. Uh, these two papers are seminal papers that talk about this. One is a technical report, the other is an ISCA paper. And this, uh, this picture is actually from this nice paper that talks about execution-based prediction using speculative slices. This is a general idea that could be used for performance-critical instructions, not just cache misses, but also for branches, you can see. So here we see two major problems in uh, systems, branches, unpredictable branches, hard to predict branches, and cache missing loads. Uh, the idea is you have the main program over here. Uh, you insert a fork or spawn saying, execute a piece of this program, prune it maybe, so that you get to the cache miss earlier. And then when the, when the program actually reaches this load, it gets a cache hit. Similarly, you can fork a piece of the program over here that does pre-computation for the branch direction. And the when the program actually reaches the branch, you get the branch prediction and use it. So if your branch predictor is not doing well, because it's a very, very hard to predict branch, do uh, pre-compute the branch somehow using this thread-based execution. So you can see that that's a very general idea. And this is a beautiful picture that summarizes all of the idea. Right? Then the question is, of course, how do you make it work? Right? There are many issues over here. Where do you execute the pre-computation threads? As we have discussed, there are multiple things over here. They all basically have different uh, implications in terms of sharing of resources with the main program and also the distance from the main program, such that if you prefetch, for example, into the L2, you maybe not be covering all of the latency, right? So again, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of these in detail, but you should think about it. Uh, these are general issues. Uh, you could be executing in the same core, same context when the main thread is stalled also, right? When do you spawn the pre-computation thread? Where, where does that fork instruction uh, go over here? Now you have a problem again, right? If you put the fork instruction too early, maybe you will never get to this load or never get to this branch if you put the fork instruction early. But you want to put it early enough so that this cache miss is done right before this load is executed, for example, right? If you actually put the fork instruction right here, maybe the cache miss that's generated over here is done over here and the load stops. Okay. 
Yeah, I think I've already said this. This is a general issue with prefetching. Here, it's converted to where should you put the spawn instruction for the thread, right? Or you can do it when the main thread is stalled, right? When do you terminate the pre-computation thread? Becomes interesting also. Uh, maybe you insert cancel instructions, stop instructions, or maybe you use throttling mechanisms based on feedback and effectiveness of the prefetching, right? So there are many design options over here. So this is a paper that does this purely in software, uh, assuming some instruction support. Uh, basically, if you want to know about this, I would recommend reading this paper. It's a beautiful paper. Uh, uh, but basically, these are some examples. Uh, I'm going to show you a code example also. It, it, it basically discusses many issues in software-based pre-execution. So uh, you can see that here is main execution and pre-execution. For example, if the, when the main program is going through this pointer chain in a hash table, you may actually spawn a, another uh, thread that pre-executes this linked list in another bucket of the hash table. And basically, it's, looking, it's doing another lookup. And this is doing another lookup, another lookup. So you can parallelize these lookups. You can see that. Uh, you can do it in arrays. Uh, you can do it in multiple procedure calls. When the main program is executing this procedure call, you actually spawn another thread such that that speculative thread actually prefetches stuff in this procedure call. Remember, the goal is just to prefetch. Here, we're not parallelizing the program. It looks like speculative parallelization of the program with one big difference. You're not, uh, basically, your, your sole purpose is to prefetch, meaning you're not, uh, uh, you're not keeping track of any of the other results that are produced. You're just generating addresses, getting the data, and those data is getting fed into the caches. That's the difference between like parallelization of a program and uh, speculative execution for prefetching in this particular case, right? Essentially, you're speculatively parallelizing the program, but just for prefetching. So you could do it at function calls. You could do it at multiple control flow paths while the main program is executing here. You may actually jump ahead over here and execute these later control flow paths that may be coming up if you have that sort of knowledge, right? So basically, the uh, opportunities are kind of endless, if you will. You can actually jump to a completely different place in the program, right? Maybe, I don't know, a million instructions later, you will get there. Maybe you'll never get there. But maybe you have a good idea that you will get there. It's an outer loop somewhere. And you start prefetching that, right? So uh, programmer can actually a lot of intuition potentially if they know what they're doing, uh, if they have a sense of performance. Basically, if you if you don't have any sense of performance, so this may be difficult. So this is an example over here. I will not go through this in detail. You can read it in your free time. But basically, what's happening over here is uh, you're going uh, through. Uh, let's say okay, you're going through a linked list over here. This while arc in. Uh, yeah, this is actually generating a lot of cache misses over here. Uh, and you can see that uh, what's happening over here is uh, before you get to this linked list traversal, so, and then you're, you're actually going through multiple uh, linked lists. So this is one linked list traversal, and then you increment it, you do another linked list traversal, and then you increment the thing, you do another linked list traversal. So there are multiple linked list traversals going over a trips list. So this program is actually a vehicle scheduling program. NCF is a famous program that has very high uh, memory uh, demands, let's say. Uh, so you can parallelize these multiple linked list traversals. And the way it's done is uh, you in, before the linked list traversal, you uh, do a pre-execute start, which launches a pre-execution thread. Uh, and that goes from here. You can see that, N4. So it increments the I over here. So it goes to next linked list traversal. And then it stops with the pre-execute stop over here. And then that thread itself, that, pre, that speculative thread itself, reaches this pre-execute start. When it reaches the pre-execute start, it, start, it spawns another pre-speculative thread for the next linked list traversal. So it could actually keep spawning these pre-speculative threads for every linked list traversal this way. OK, and you can read. There's more information that essentially says what I just, says, what I just said, but with a little bit more information. So for this, you need some ISA extensions. You need to be able to spawn a thread using this information pre-execute start start PC and the maximum number of instructions to be executed to ensure that you don't basically execute too many instructions, for example. Pre-execute stop basically terminates that thread. Uh, and pre-execute cancel, here uh, the, the main program can cancel a thread that has started. And it could be useful if the main program, for example, says, I don't need this anymore. Right? So basically, this is completely software-controlled pre-execution. And this paper shows that there's a lot of benefit to be gained in a simultaneous multi-threaded processor. Basically, you launch these threads on other thread context in the same core. And you can see that there's significant performance improvement in many workloads, tough workloads, some of them, MCF, for example, minimum span entry, traversal ray tracing. But some workloads, you actually increase the execution time. 
So this doesn't work in some other workloads. Maybe they don't do a good enough throttling, for example, over there, but you can read the paper for more detail. Okay. So how do you construct this thread? Uh, well, in, the, in that case, in this particular case, we're not constructing the thread carefully in the sense that there's overhead. What we're doing is basically we're using the exact same program for the traversal. We're just spawning uh, the next iterations, right, of the same loop. Here, you can actually construct that pre, uh, thread more carefully. Basically, you can identify what's a cache missing load, what's a branch miss prediction, and traverse the backward dependence chains and figure out which instruction feeds to that dependence chain and only execute that. So this, these papers talk about how to construct uh, these speculative slices, as they call them, speculative threads, essentially. So I'm not going to go into this again, but uh, you can get the idea, basically. You identify the performance critical instructions, and then you identify the backward dependence chains, and that's your thread, basically. Then the question becomes, where do you fork that thread? And we discussed that. You need to be careful. Usually, you need to go out. But if you go out too far, then you may actually have an issue. And these papers evaluate a lot of these. But for example, uh, if you look uh, at over here, uh, there's some uh, problematic instruction over here. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's basically this load instruction over here. And then also there's a branch instruction. But basically, these are the critical instructions. And this is the entire program, main program. And these folks show that you can distill the program if you just want to execute the stuff that leads to this address of the load as well as the branch uh, data values that the branch uses. You just need these instructions. So you can see that uh, it's much smaller than the original code. And the slice contains a loop that mimics the loop in the original code. That may not be perfect. You can actually mimic what's going on. So basically, you don't need to execute the entire program like this to get, uh, uh, to get the addresses of cache missing instructions and the data values of the branches that are mispredicted. Hopefully that makes sense, right? Not everything you do in a program feeds to those, basically. OK, any questions? OK, cool. <laughs> any? So I think this is uh, fascinating. Clearly, there's a lot of work that has been done on pre-execution. Uh, we've talked about runhead execution, if you remember. I'll go into a little bit more detail over here, because this fits into the pre-execution techniques. We didn't go into a lot of detail. Uh, but uh, this comes from a different perspective. And the perspective is really, uh, because it was developed at a, at, a, at a time where people were trying to build very large instruction windows. Uh, and uh, the goal of this technique is to get the memory level parallelism benefits or prefetching benefits of a large window without having to build a large window. And the idea, as we have discussed earlier, is when the oldest instruction is a long latency cache miss, you checkpoint the architectural state, enter a speculative processing mode, run ahead mode. In this mode, you speculatively pre-execute instructions. The purpose of pre-execution is solely to generate prefetches. And you don't stall due to unavailability of data. If a, a, if a data value is unavailable because it depends on a miss, you mark it as invalid and drop it. Another way of doing this could be value prediction. Predict that value and keep going ahead. When the original miss returns, you restore the checkpoint, flush the pipeline, and resume normal execution. So basically, what we're doing is we're using the main program as a speculative thread that keeps running while the main thread is otherwise going to be stalled. In that sense, this is exact like speculative pre-execution, right? OK, so I think you've seen this, so I will not go through this in detail. But uh, with a small window processor, you stole a lot because your cache misses block the instruction window, and you stole. But with runahead, what you do is whenever you get a long latency cache miss, when that becomes the oldest instruction, you enter a speculative processing mode called runahead mode. In this mode, basically, you don't stall the processor. And if instructions are actually, when the instructions are done, you, you throw them away. You keep their results in the register file, of course. And hopefully, you get to the second load miss if it's independent. And then you parallelize the first load miss and the second load miss in the memory hierarchy. When, you, when the first load miss is returned from memory, you flush the processor, checkpoint, uh, restore the checkpoint. So you re-execute from load one again. And that hits in the caches because you just prefetched it. And you keep computing. And load two miss returns back after some point. And when, you, when the main program actually gets to load two, it hits in the cache. So basically, you save cycles this way. Basically, you're pre, instead of stalling, you're using those otherwise stall cycles for speculative pre-execution. And this parallelizes your cache misses, assuming those cache misses are independent of each other. If the address of this load was dependent on address of this load, uh, the, the, the data coming from this load, 
meaning, meaning if you were doing a linked list traversal, this wouldn't work. We're going to talk about methods to break that dependence, but yeah. Okay, so I've already discussed this basically. Instructions can be prefetched this way also. Basically, it's, a, it's an automatic method for prefetching uh, data, instructions, and also training hardware prefetcher and branch predictor as uh, papers show, instead of stalling. Let's take a look at how this works a little bit more uh, because it's, it's very similar to what the processor does. Uh, this run ahead mode is very similar to what you would do in normal mode, except it's purely specul speculative. Basically, architectural register or memory state is not updated. It's nothing software visible is updated. The whole purpose is prefetching, just like pre-execution threads that we have shown earlier. L2 misdependent instructions are identified and treated specially, basically. They're quickly removed from the instruction window so that they're not stalling the window. Their results are not trusted. Again, another way of doing this is trusting the results. So we, we opted for, in our original paper, we opted for saying, don't trust the result, mark them as bogus or invalid, and don't, uh, you don't use that data for anything. Another way is just predicting the value and keep going ahead. And that actually is not too bad also. So there are two types of results that are produced, invalid and valid. Invalid means it's dependent on a long latency cache miss. It could be any instruction, actually. You could generalize this. Uh, invalid results are marked using invalid bits in the register file and the store buffer. And they're not used for prefetching and branch resolution because you don't know the, you really don't trust these values because the values are not available yet. Right? So you remove the instructions from the window when the oldest instruction, um, when it's an oldest instruction. If it's invalid, then you remove it from the window immediately because you don't have the result. A valid instruction is removed when it completes execution or becomes invalid because it gets a cache miss. Right? And these instructions are called pseudo retired because you're not really retiring them to the architectural state, but you're really speculatively retiring them without affecting the architectural state. And they free their allocated resources, which enables allocation of those resources for future instructions. This is how you keep the window busy, basically. New instructions keep coming in. And I'm not going to talk about this, but stores communicate to loads, and you can read from the paper. So I will skip this. There needs to be some store load communication that you need to handle well. But that, again, that doesn't always need to be correct also. So how do you handle branches? Uh, so if you have an invalid branch, uh, it cannot be resolved because you don't have the data for it, right? Now, if, you have, if your branch predictor was correct, if it predicted it correctly, that's great, no problem, but you don't know it. If it's a mispredicted invalid branch, again, you don't know if it's mispredicted, but you'll be on the wrong path after that point because you cannot recover from it because you don't have the data value to recover, right? So the processor may stay on the wrong path until the end of the run ahead execution, basically. But valid branches can be resolved. So during this execution, invalid branches can be resolved. Okay, so it's basically very similar to the execution that you would do in normal processing mode, except it's purely speculative and it distinguishes between these values that are available versus not available and treats them separately. And this is uh, uh, a runhead processor diagram kind of loosely based on the Pentium 4 uh, processor at the time, but I'm not talking about it. So uh, the overheads are relatively small, basically. So the advantage is this actually generates very accurate prefetches for data and instructions because it follows the program path, right? Uh, to all cache levels. Uh, in fact, uh, many works shown that the accuracy of prefetches is more than 95%. Uh, it's simple to implement. As I said, most of the hardware is built in. No waste of hardware context. It used the main thread context for prefetching. But you could also do this on a separate context. And as we will see later, you could also design a specialized structure to do this. And we will see the reasons for it also. Uh, there's no need to construct a special purpose pre-execution thread for prefetching. But we will do that actually in later work because there's a good reason for it. But in the initial form, it's very simple, basically. But of course, it has limitations like extra executed instructions. But that's true for all speculative pre-execution based mechanisms. It's limited by branch prediction accuracy. That's true for all speculative pre-execution based mechanisms. So these uh, execution based prefetching mechanisms are all limited by these. Uh, cannot prefetch dependent cache misses. This is a limitation of run execution, but may not. This may not be a limitation of all pre-executed uh, pre-execution based mechanisms. Uh, effectiveness is limited by the available memory level parallelism. And also prefetch distance, how far ahead you prefetch is limited by the latency of how long, uh, basically when, whenever the ca original cache miss comes back, uh, you return back to the original uh, run, uh, normal mode. So how many things you can prefetch is depend on how long you stay in run ahead mode, basically. And this is going to be a problem, basically, because uh, you don't want to limit your prefetch distance to the latency of a cache miss necessarily. Maybe you should always be prefetching with some separate thread, right? Okay, so the good news is implemented in many processors, and this is results. I will not uh, go into a lot of detail, uh, but you can see that it buys performance on top of a very aggressive prefetcher at the time. 
Uh, and it also gets close to the performance of a very large instruction window at the time. Again, these are uh, results from 2002, basically. So you can basically get the benefits of a 384 entry window uh, without building that window. This is an instruction window. And it works for out-of-order and in-order processors, basically. And you can see that in, in order processors, its performance improvement is even higher because in order processor by nature doesn't have a lot of latency tolerance uh, built in, right? Okay, so you can see these results. These, this is going to be one of the papers that you read. And yeah, that's the paper. So uh, uh, I will show you one thing over here. This, is, this was implemented in Sunrock, and uh, they basically showed then uh, some online transaction processing workloads. If you implement run ahead, which they called Scout, you get 40% better performance. But you could also trade this off with caching. And this is always true. How much resources should you dedicate to caching? How much resources should you dedicate to prefetching? Right. It's, a, it's an interesting thing, basically. So th these folks show that for the same performance level, if you implement run ahead, it gets you the performance of a system with seven more megabytes of cache without run ahead. And for the first the same performance level over here, if you implement run ahead, it gets you the performance of a system uh, that has 12 more megabytes of cache without run ahead. So basically, you're prefetching. You can actually reduce the space you dedicate to cache by making a, having a good prefetcher. Now, this is always actually true. This is not a new thing, but it's, like, it's actually good to see that uh, this actually is played in, in real systems. There's a paper from 1994. Uh, I think it's Paul Charla and Kessler, where they showed that you can get rid of the L2 cache in streaming workloads and just have stream buffers, essentially. That's the idea. You can put that paper also from 1994. I think when, when, when Joel wakes up, he'll put it. <laughs> okay, Mohammed will remind him. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, you can read more about this uh, in uh, Sunrack. Actually, they have implemented other stuff. This is a relatively complicated uh, microarchitecture where they actually reuse some of the results that are generated during run ahead execution also. That becomes a little bit hairy because not, you're not perfectly speculative anymore. IBM Power 6 also implements this, and you can read a little bit more about this. IBM Power 6 is actually interesting because it implements a lot of throttling mechanisms as well. Okay, uh, and NVIDIA's ARM processor also describes this nicely, but I don't have time to go over this in detail right now because I want to cover one more idea, uh, if possible, before we uh, take off. Maybe we'll start with a little bit of the summary of this. Uh, okay, there's a bunch of run-ahead enhancements. Uh, one of the issues with run-ahead is energy inefficiency because you execute a large number of instructions and you speculatively execute them. So uh, there have been techniques that are developed to make this efficient, uh, eliminate inefficient periods, et cetera. This is, you can think of this as like a throttling. So you have this prefetcher that's normally quite good, but sometimes it's extremely inefficient. So throttle when it's inefficient. So throttling can be employed in many prefetchers. The pointer intensive applications, as I said, you cannot prefetch dependent cache misses. So you can predict when possible the data values. As a result, you can prefetch some of these dependent cache misses. It doesn't work in all cases. It works in when there are predictable patterns. In the, in, in, not in the addresses, but the, between the deltas, between the addresses. You, can, you cannot recover from a mispredicted L2 miss or invalid branch. And we've looked at a lot of wrong path analysis for this. I'm not going to talk about that. But I will talk about this limited run ahead distance a little bit because it's actually, uh, I believe this work uh, about like 13 years after run ahead kind of unleashed a much better potential from run ahead as we will see. Basically, the problem is run ahead ends when the miss that caused it returns. How do you tackle it? So these are some papers that I will not go into. I'm going to point to some lecture, but probably I'll do it next week. Uh, so there are ways of making this much more efficient and effective, as you can see. So let's talk about uh, making it even more effective than the previous works I've done. So I will cover this and then we'll end. So basically, uh, the observation in this work is run it works well, no question about that, but it's not achieving its potential. It covers only 13% of all run ahead reachable misses. And this work defines run ahead reachable misses as any miss. Uh, that is not dependent on the original miss. So it's a very high bar, no question about that, because it could be happening at the end of the program, right? But our goal is also high. So why? Because running execution interval actually tends to be relatively short. On average, relatively short because instruction window size have gotten large also. Uh, and the prefetchers have been very aggressive. So whenever you get a cache miss, uh, it doesn't go, always go all the way to memory. On average, it's 60 cycles, for example, if with, a, with, a, with, a, with a quite aggressive instruction window over here. So, which means that Renate ends after the miss that causes its service. Even then, it buys uh, reasonable performance, as you can see over here. Okay, so the idea over here is uh, not as simple, uh, but it builds on 
what happened. Basically, you want to keep Red Hat going even after a long latency cache misses service so that you can discover other cache misses while the program is also going. So I have two threads now, if you will. One is specialized for Red Hat execution, and the other is the main program, and they both keep going. And the hope is that this specialized thread is prefetching stuff early, discovering stuff early, such that the main program is not stolen. That's the idea. This idea is actually kind of similar to slipstream processors, but uh, that was developed in 2000 or so, in S plus 2000. But there, the complexity was very high. Here, we have a relatively simple mechanism. So what is the idea? Well, how do you make it happen? Basically, identify chains of instructions that lead to long latency cache misses. We do it purely in hardware. Because in hardware, you can actually construct this dependence chain by looking at the out of order execution engine. And you keep executing each chain of instructions in a loop in run ahead mode using specialized run ahead execution hardware, which is called continuous run ahead engine. And the interesting thing over here is that you want to continue generating long latency cache misses. And this is located in the memory controller. Basically, now push the run ahead engine to the memory controller so that the memory controller quickly generates, executes these things. And this is a very lean execution engine. It, it can skip a lot of instructions, basically. For example, you don't need to have floating point computation. You don't need to have, basically, you just need to have the hardware that's useful for address generation, mostly. And you stop executing the chain after a fixed number of instructions. And what is that fixed number of instructions? So this is not necessarily the best way, clearly, but this is what we have explored. And the paper shows that executing 100,000 instructions is actually not bad. That, that gets you a lot of benefits. So you cannot imagine executing 100,000 instructions in run ahead mode because you would be delaying the normal program. But with this, now you have a specialized engine that's running ahead separately from the main program. And it could be running ahead 100,000 and more instructions because it's not executing the entire program also, right? Now you can see the potential benefits. It's running ahead much farther, right? So you've decoupled the prefetching threads from the main program completely this way. No, not completely because you use the main program to generate the prefetching thread. And the key results are actually quite promising. Uh, you get 70% coverage of run-ahead reachable misses. And this is a lot, actually. This was higher than what we expected also, up from 23, uh, 13%. And you get a lot of performance improvement over the best run-ahead implementation in single core systems. And this best run-ahead implementation is actually not what I described as run-ahead, but what other people had built called run-ahead buffer in 2015, micro. Uh, so it's better than what I just described earlier. And you can see uh, some results over here, which I'm not going to go into. Uh, but I think this is actually, uh, uh, this has unleashed some potential that Renhead had, but never exploited. Uh, and this sort of idea, I believe, actually improves things uh, significantly. Uh, the downside is there's complexity mold, of course. Right now, you have a specialized engine. You can think of this as a hardware accelerator for Renhead execution or prefetching. Right? It's a, it's a simple engine that sits in the memory controller that does this sort of prefetching. But I think the results are quite promising. Okay, I will not go into more of this. This is the paper. And again, you can review this, uh, hopefully, in the next homework. But I believe we're already out of time. <laughs> is that correct? Yes. Any questions? Any burning questions? Okay, so next week, I think I'll wrap this up. We're almost done with prefetching. But you can ask more questions next week also after digesting some of this material. So uh, have a good weekend. I'll see you next week. Take care.